for doom. Dude.
progeny. Oh. <laughs> Thank you.
have no idea to this day what that lady was singing about. The truth is, I don't want to know. I tell you, that boy saw it. It was like some kind of pink dinosaur walked into a drab little cage and used its powerful tail to knock those walls away. And for the briefest of moments, every last man at Shawshank was a pink little dinosaur too. Well, hello, hello, everybody, and uh, welcome back to Paleontologizing. It uh, makes me smile how many people enjoy that little cold open video that I put together there. <laughs> um, it makes me laugh. I'm glad it makes you laugh, too. Welcome to a special Friday edition of Paleontologizing. I mean, we stream most Fridays, but today's a special Friday. It is World Rhinoceros Day today. And uh, we're going to be talking all about rhinoceros. We're going to be celebrating these amazing perissodactyls. We'll be talking about the fossil history of rhinoceros and their conservation in our present day. And then later, we're going to wrap up the stream with a, uh, a rollicking game of who wants to be a millionaire or who wants to be a paleontologist, really. A review game. It's going to be a ton of fun. It's been a while since we've done this. I'm excited for it. We've got some good questions today. Anyway, if you're here for the very first time, which I'm sure some of you are, welcome, welcome to Paleontologizing. I'm glad you could make it. My name is Danny Anduza. I'm a dinosaur paleontologist. And I stream every day, every weekday, here on Twitch. Just call me the world's first full-time live-streaming paleontologist. This is actually how I make my living, believe it or not. Um, this is how I fund my research, my field work, and everything else. Because I study dinosaurs, I publish on them in the scientific literature, and I dig up dinosaurs during the summer. We were actually live-streaming that this summer via satellite in Wyoming and Utah, way out in the middle of nowhere, digging up dinosaurs live on camera. It was a ton of fun, and um, if you'd like to see that, you should go ahead and check out the YouTube page. Uh, anyway, yeah. And Dinosaur Dave, we will be looking at the Madgeburg Unicorn. Yes, indeed, Madgeburg Unicorn. That's going to be interesting. Anyway, yeah, welcome to Paleontologizing. If any of you have got any questions, then do not keep those questions to yourself. Please bring those to the forefront. Type them into the chat. That is, uh, is what sets this kind of a broadcast apart from something like a YouTube video or something. This is interactive. That's what I think makes this so special. Twitch, as a medium for science outreach, is it allows that kind of interaction in real time. If you've got questions about dinosaurs, which are what I work on, or about rhinoceros, which I don't work on, but I know a couple of things about rhinoceros, I suppose, and I'm eager to learn about them like you are, let's talk about them. Or if you've got broader questions about the fossil record, extinction, evolution, how science works, I'm here to answer your questions, so uh, please do not be shy with those questions. Bring them on out, and, uh, and we'll answer them. We'll learn something together. I see that Smorphosaurus has requested a dinosaur deep dive for Edmontosaurus. If it's okay with you, Smorph, we'll save that for Monday, and I'll get some stuff ready for an Edmontosaurus dinosaur deep dive. Because, man, is there a lot to talk about there. I've actually dug up some Edmontosaurus before. Um, we'll talk about that. Yeah. Good stuff. Good stuff. Um, anyway, let's uh, scroll through chat real quick, and we'll see who is here. I've already lost the top of chat. Shoot. But Smorf, Lenino, Kodali, Matt M33. Uh, how are you all doing? Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you here. Happy Friday to you. Hope you're ready for the weekend. Or, if you're... Uh, down under, like Dinosaur Dave, whom I saw in the chat earlier. Um, happy Saturday to you. I hope it's going well. Uh, Kodali's here too. What's shaking, Kodali? Welcome, welcome. Uh, Diluta, good morning to you too. How are you? It's good to have you here. And Mr. Maxi19, I'm glad you're back. Welcome back to Paleontologizer. I'm glad you could make it today. And you have inadvertently almost created with those emotes, with the 
Baryonyx back half and the Triceratops front half. That looks a lot like the Madgeberg, Madgeberg unicorn. We'll be talking about that in a little bit. Oliver is here. How you doing, Oliver? Howdy, howdy. Arle, what's shaking with you? Happy weekend to you. I hope uh, hope you're doing well. Texas Cryptid, hello, hello. I hope things are going well for you. Uh, Trixmot, what's shaking with you? Glad you're here. Ghostly Ghoul, howdy, howdy. Welcome back. And Brian the Primate. Hello, Brian. Welcome back to Paleotologizing. Ariatalia, hello, hello. I'm trying to scroll down without it zipping around too much. Tommy Plotticus, how are you doing? Thagamizmer, good to have you here. Ghostly Ghoul says, time for a $5 shake. That's funny. In 1994, when uh, Pulp Fiction came out, that was 94, right? That was probably a lot of money for a milkshake. Nowadays, you'd be lucky to find a milkshake for, for that much. Yeah. Sandwich Nom Nom, how are you doing? Welcome, welcome. Mia Mia Coda. Howdy, howdy. Bet Medler, with those styracosaurs there. How are you doing, Bet? Hello. Fiery Fay is here too. How you doing, Fiery Fay? Glad you could make it today. Trend K, how are you doing? Yeah. Uh, Squiggles Dagabo, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Yeah. Nebraska Farmer says, I think rhinos, Sensulato, are a prime example of. Oh. And the chat moved, and I. Oh, goodness. What were you saying, Nebraska Farmer? Define this. Uh, prime example why looking at the paleo diversity in contrast to the extant crown group is so important. Absolutely, Nebraska Farmer. And do you still uh, you still reside in Nebraska? Because when I was visiting Nebraska last summer, not this past summer, but summer 2022, I made a very important rhinoceros stop on my journey in Nebraska. We'll be talking about that really cool fossil site today. Uh, yeah. So get ready for it. Maybe we'll even pull up some of the footage from that. Um, but yeah, yeah. And Lenina, you're doing great. You are under no obligation to greet everyone who comes in, Lenina. Goodness. I... You're not even getting paid. You're just doing this out of the goodness of your own heart, because you're a wonderful person, Lenina. Um... You're under no obligation to greet everyone, but we appreciate you nonetheless. Two Chooks, how you doing? Welcome, welcome, Relo Rolo. I'm trying to say hello to everybody. Caravan, happy Equinox Eve. Is that tomorrow? Is the autumnal Equinox, or was it today or yesterday? I thought it's usually September 21st or 22nd. Yeah. Paleo Lord says, sounds like it's going to be a fun day. It's always a fun day here on Paleontologizing, Paleo Lord. Shoot, we've even got good news about rhino conservation today. So, uh, cheers. I'm glad you're back, Paleo Lord. How do you not have a, a gift sub yet? <laughs> It'll happen, I bet. You stick around. Or if you'd like to subscribe yourself, get all those emotes, all that good stuff. You can do it for free if you have Amazon Prime. The Equinox is 9.23. Oh, gotcha, Lenina. Okay. The Chevy Equinox? No. Something far more reliable than that, Brannington. God, I used to sell those. Ugh. Honestly, not a car I would recommend. That's why I ended up moving to Toyota from Chevy. Um. No. It's more reliable. It comes around every year on schedule. The Autumnal Equinox. Yeah. Uh, twice even. Well, I mean, no, once a year, the autumnal... E no, autumnal and vernal equinox. Yeah, you're right, I guess. The autumnal equinox comes once a year. But, um... Yeah. Autumnal equinox. Here, let's... Take a look at this, perhaps. The night sky has always been humanity's most ancient time clock. The mm. movement and absence of the sun guides the day and the night. The months are measured by the phases of the moon, and every season begins with a solstice or equinox. As yep. the autumn season approaches in the northern... And so this is, this is something that 
I think is really important. This is just like basic, basic science 101 right here. Um, Earth science 101, we're talking about the tilt of the Earth's axis and why that is the reason for the season. So let's talk about it. The days grow shorter, the nights become longer until we meet the days of the autumn equinox, yeah. also called the fall equinox. In mm -hmm. this video, we will explore the concept of really? the autumn equinox. No expense. And Nescalo. To the tier one sub to the underscore OG underscore mountain underscore dragon. Nescalo, thank you for that gift sub there. I appreciate it. And uh, Dragon, I hope you enjoy that gift sub. Not having to watch any ads for the next... 30 days, thanks to Nescalo. Thank you, Nescalo. I appreciate you. And look, look, look. Shoot. We're now only 49 subs away from our goal for the whole week. We've got a, a weekly sub goal now. I'm trying this out, and holy cow, that is... Uh... We're getting there. Oh, sorry, 102. We've got 48 left. That's only four 12s. We only need four people to give 12 gift subs, and then, <laughs> then we're... Or 24 people to give two gift subs. Dinosaurs hold a special magnetism for children. <laughs> oh no. Danny, Happy you James. are blowing young minds like a marine sniper. <laughs> <laughs> Trappy, don't say that, Yowza. But I appreciate you. Thank you for the 16 months, Trappy. And Mr. Maxi, five gift subs. Holy cow. Five, that was actually six that I did right there, but five, ding, ding, ding. Five gift subs from Mr. Maxi. Thank you kindly for that. I really appreciate it. Look, we're at 108 out of 150 now. We only need 42 more. And 42. What's the significance of the number 42? Well, it's six times seven is what it is. Um, anyway, Mr. Maxi, thank you for those five gift subs. I really appreciate that. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Uh, um, it's the answer to everything? Yes, famously. If you're taking a math test, every answer is always 42. No, what are you talking about, Nescala? The secret moment in the very beginning of this strange dinosaur's life. HD and HB. 42 is the answer. See, this is maybe why I never did very well in math at school, because I, I put other numbers down as answers other than 42, because I didn't know that cheat code. Vela the Wench. Well, hello, hello. 19 raiders are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. Holy cow, welcome to Paleontologizing. It's great to have you here. Holy moly. Up. Oh. How you doing, raiders? Welcome, welcome. The great dinosaurs. I hope you're ready to comprehend and appreciate the great dinosaurs just like uh, Kodali right there. Kodali, thank you for the 19 months of support. I really appreciate that. And Smorphosaurus, thank you for gifting Paleo Lord. Thank you, thank you, Smorph. We are swiftly approaching our sub goal for the whole week. This is excellent. Anyway, Vela the Wench, how did your stream go? How did it go? I hope it was really, really good. Welcome to Paleontologizer. I'm glad you could be here. Um, thank you for joining us. Uh, Vela says, I'm good. Hope you can check out the game I was playing. What was that? Holy cow, we're getting more, we're getting more gift subs right now. Uh, Murph. Oh, Nebraska Farmer. Thank you for those five gift subs. I really appreciate that, Nebraska Farmer. And thank you, Murph, for gifting Vela the Wench. I appreciate that. Vela. Vela, what game were you playing? Let's take a look. Um, Vela was playing... I'm not sure, but... Uh, Hiluli WS, welcome, welcome. Megvu, Morken7, how are you doing, everybody? Welcome to Paleontologizing. Paleo Pines. I might have to take a look at that. This drawer contains almost all of the North American identified specimens of Troodon. 
Well, very cool. It comes out Tuesday? Uh, oh, wow. It, it comes out on my birthday. My birthday is Tuesday. Um, interesting. Interesting. Uh, that's funny. I didn't hear anything from the... the dev when Dinosaur Fossil Hunter came out, the devs actually reached out to me. Sent me an advanced copy. Same with, um... With Prehistoric Planet. Prehistoric Park. No. Prehistoric Kingdom. A dinosaur. Delta Rain, is this true? Thank you for the 25 months of support, Delta Rain. I appreciate that very, very much. Welcome. Well, we're gonna have to check out Paleo Pines, maybe. I don't know. I'm gonna have a busy week next week. But, uh, let's take a look at... Whoa. This is a big-time game, isn't it? A dino ranching game. Huh. Parasaurolophus right there? It looks kind of like the Parasaurolophus from our emotes. Cool. I like how it walks on four legs but runs on two. Styracosaurus. We've got Styracosaurus emotes also. So far, we're two for two. Is this Tyrannosaurus? We're three for three. Oh, I don't have Pachycephalosaurus. Not yet, at least. But, uh, that's neat. Oh, this is cool. It's like Amnimal Crossing, but with, uh, with non-avian dinosaurs. Animal Crossing also has non-avian dinosaurs in the museum, as I understand it. But yeah, very cool. Very cool. Uranosaurus? Well, we're going to have to check that out. Well, well, well. I hope it's available for the uh the personal computer. Is that a shoot, is that right there a Therizinosaur? Is that Falcarius right there? It's kind of tough to tell with the feathers. No, 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 that's an Ornithomimosaur. Ah, uh, very cool. And it'll be on Steam. Steam is... Yeah, I have Steam. Okay. It's easy to get that mixed up. Steam Deck and Stream Deck and... And... Well, I guess those are the two that I get mixed up. Anyway, I have Steam. I do not have a Stream Deck, though. Anyway, that'll be really neat. And, Vela, thank you. You say thank you for the warm welcome. Thank you for the wonderful raid. I appreciate that. Uh, my name is Danny Anduza. Like I said, I am a dinosaur paleontologist. I work on dinosaurs. I dig up dinosaurs. I publish on dinosaurs in the scientific literature. I'm one of those people who uh, is lucky enough to be able to make their living... Advancing Dinosaur Science. I actually make my living here on Twitch nowadays, but talking about dinosaurs. Today, we're actually going to be talking about rhinoceros, primarily, because today is World Rhino Day. So we'll be getting to our rhinoceros content in a little bit, but first, I think a, a welcome video is in order for anybody who might be new here and would like a, a little welcome to the channel to tell you what paleontologizing is all about, how in the world a paleontologist got here on Twitch in the first place. So, uh, without further ado, let's call forth our old friend, previously recorded, Danny. No expense. And thank you, Smorf, for gifting Megvu. I appreciate that, Smorf. Thank you, thank you. Yeah. Um... He's, he's sneaking up behind me right now. So we will let him take center stage. And uh, sit tight. You're in good hands with previously recorded, Danny. The floor is yours. Well, thanks for present day, Danny. Well, if you happen to be new around here, then welcome to paleontologizing. You may well be wondering to yourself, uh, well, if this is Twitch, then where are the video games? I'm going to level with you here. I don't really do much in the way of video games. I'm a paleontologist. My name is Danny Anduza, and dinosaurs are my area of study. But how in the world
world does a paleontologist end up on Twitch? Well, you're about to find out. When I finished high school, I moved to Montana and immediately started work at the Museum of the Rockies, which at the time was an unparalleled powerhouse of paleobiology. That program was built by this guy. Famed paleontologist Alan Grant. Well, kind of. You consulted on that movie. I did consult on the, all and those movies. And they said the, the guy Alan Grant was you. <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, fortunately, he didn't get eaten. <laughs> <laughs> Meet Jack Horner, the real-life Alan Grant. He's one of the most prominent and controversial paleontologists in the country, a dyslexic MacArthur Foundation genius who never finished college and who says he doesn't care why dinosaurs went extinct. To him, the important part is how they lived. It was at Museum of the Rockies, under the auspects of Jack Horner, that I learned how to be a dinosaur paleontologist. And a huge part of that I learned by working with Jack's final graduate student, a guy by the name of Denver Fowler, who would later go on to become curator of the Badlands Dinosaur Museum. Working with Denver, I did summer after summer of fieldwork in the remote Badlands of Montana. Together, we dug up more dinosaurs than we knew what to do with, at fossil sites numbering in the hundreds. In 2012, I discovered a new species of Ceratopsian dinosaur, hopefully soon to be published. The next year, we excavated the world's smallest and youngest Tyrannosaurus rex. Then, we dug up a brand new Ankylosaur. Montana's news leader. Five paleontologists are excavating what looks to likely be a new species of armored dinosaur. So we found its head, and we found parts of its armor and plates, and so it, it should be a new species. Not bad, right? Well, anyway, much like my fieldwork, my research also focuses on dinosaurs. For example, here's Triarchonchus, the last of the alvarosaurs, just published in July of 2020. One of my current projects focuses on spinosaurids. I can't really talk too much about that until it's a little bit closer to publication, so uh, stay tuned for that. Anyway, let's get back to how I ended up on Twitch. A couple years ago, things in Montana were declining rapidly. So I picked up and moved on to greener pastures. I'm so glad I did. And with that new perspective, I also realized that I have very little patience for the soul-crushing bureaucracy within academia. For the time being, anyway, I decided to take my career in a slightly different direction. I got hired for a job in early childhood education. As a teacher, I get to have a positive impact on kids' lives, and help them find a passion for science. Then, when COVID-19 showed up, the school had to close. But that didn't stop the teaching or the learning. We just moved online. All right, friends. So, we're going to be looking at a book in a little bit, but I thought we'd start off with a song. At three, two, two. one. Oh, give me a home Where the hadrosaurs roamed Where triceratops bellowed and grazed Where erosion uncovers Bones we seek to discover For to strike the whole world amazed It was a pretty easy jump from teaching online to streaming on Twitch. I had my first broadcast in May, and I've been on here ever since. Now I believe pretty strongly that any good scientist should also be a public servant. In my opinion, talking to everyday people about her science is one of the most important things that a researcher can do. I now have a golden opportunity to reach out directly to people where they are. This is what I'm all about, and now thanks to Twitch, I get to share it with you, and I'm so happy to be able to do so. 
It's my intention to continue this mission of education by answering your questions, providing good science content, and working to grow this channel. And if you could help by following, or if you could afford it by subscribing, I would be deeply grateful. So anyway, to my regular viewers, thank you again for sitting through this. To everybody who's new, welcome. I'm genuinely, earnestly glad that you're here. And I hope you stick around. We've got a remarkable little community here, and i uh, be delighted if you join us. Anyway, uh, let's go ahead and get back into it. So, uh, present day Danny, back to you. Well, thank you very much, previously recorded Danny. And of course, thank you even more... To Vela for that wonderful raid. Can we get one more shout out for Vela, please? It made reptile history. Espy, thank you. Holy moly. Five gift subs. I really appreciate that, Espy. Thank you, thank you for those five gift subs there. Look, we're at 121 out of 150 subs for the week. I think we might just make it. We might make it this week. Oh, ho, ho, ho. Yeah. And Vela is all about the dinosaurs? Well, she came to the right place. Sorry, I'm assuming she. I don't know that for sure. Vela, thank you for being here, though. I'm I'm making presumptions where I probably shouldn't. Yeah, she. Okay, cool. Well, Vela, thank you. You are in the right place, my friend. Welcome once again to paleontologizing. Holy cow. And I just realized... I don't have my uh, Allosaurus skull out front and center right now. Let's get that real quick. Our 3D printer is currently quiet. Not on. It's on the fritz right now. But let me show you something we made with the 3D printer. And Ghostly Ghoul. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much for that give sub, Ghostly Ghoul. I appreciate it. Let's grab our Allosaurus skull. Full-size 3D printed. I. We'll see what you think of it. This, this is for you, Bella. There we go. <laughs> ah! Check this out. Yeah. Allosaurus fragilis. Really excited about this. I'm still excited about this. This is a couple weeks ago that we finished this. I'm still excited about it. Holy cow. Yeah. Let's get those lights turned on. Because they, uh, they add a little something-something. Check that out. Allosaurus fragilis. Vela, I'm sure you're familiar with Allosaurus. I've got my very own 3D printed here in the office. Yeah. Um. Very cool. Allosaurus, one of our more important dinosaurs, honestly. It's, um, at least in the sense that it's very common. Allosaurus is, uh, the most common large meat-eating dinosaur from the late Jurassic Morrison formation of places like Utah, Colorado... Uh, South Dakota, Montana. Allosaurus. Pretty, pretty cool critter. Yeah. Yeah, anyway. Allosaurus. Um, can I print Scotty the T-Rex next, Mr. Maxi? I don't have files for that, or else I'd think about it. Yeah. Anyway. And Vampire, welcome back. It's good to see you here. And Iwix Art, it's good to see you too. Um, today is World Rhino Day. And let's talk about our rhinoceros friends a little bit. Let's talk about World Rhino Day. Here, take a look at this video. This is from a couple years ago from the Indianapolis Zoo. Uh, all five species of rhinos are uh, celebrated on World Rhino Day. This, of course, is the southern white rhino here at the Indianapolis Zoo. Shoot, not all five species of living rhino. We're celebrating many more species than that today because we're also going, given this is paleontologizing, we're going back in time 
to celebrate fossil species of rhino as well, because it's only through the study of fossil rhinos that we can gain proper context for understanding modern rhinoceros. We used to have so many more species of rhino than we have today. And that kind of gives us a different perspective and it makes the conservation of our modern rhino species all the more important. So we'll talk about that. Um, anyway, this is a, a white rhino. And as I understand it, the way that you can tell the difference between a white rhino and a black rhino, which are our two uh, rhinoceros species from Africa, uh, extant rhino species from Africa, is by the shape of the mouth. It's not like one is white and one is black. That's not true at all. They're both gray. White rhinos, black rhinos, they're both gray rhinos. Apparently, white rhino is actually like a, uh, a weird morphing of wide rhino because they have a wide mouth. It's wide and flat like this. Black rhinoceros have got a pointier mouth. It almost looks kind of beak-shaped. Um... Yeah. So there you go. So there's a black rhino. Way over there. With that pointy mouth. And then the white or wide rhino with the wider mouth. Uh, closer over here. See it? Does that make sense? So when you when you think white rhino, actually think wide rhino, and uh, you'll be a lot closer to the real deal. You know? Yeah. So black rhino, white or wide rhino. You got it? Isn't that cool? Yeah. Anyway. I mean, just look <laughs> at my. Uh co-star here here uh, this is gloria right so uh, you know gloria if you just look at her if you see her um she'll be in your heart forever and and that oh. is exactly why um we need to conserve rhinos and, and we welcome you to join <laughs> team rhino uh and when you're with team rhino the best thing you can do is stay aware um and one of those ways is to keep up with reports like state of the rhino so that you understand what are the issues impacting rhinos today and we, huh. each September, right before World Rhino Day, the International Rhino Foundation publishes our signature report, which is called State of the Rhino. For 2021, huh. there was good news and bad news. Some of the good news uh. is, is that populations increased for greater one-horned rhinos in India and Nepal, black rhinos uh. in Africa, and also a small increase for Java rhinos in Indonesia. However, white rhinos, like you uh, see here, had a decline and has had a decline for the last three years. And so that's oh, something no. we have to, to worry about. Basically, they're at the tipping point where births are not keeping up with poaching losses in Africa. Uh. Um, so uh, the main threats are poaching and habitat loss due to human encroachment in, in wild areas. And so we need to find a balance between wildlife and humans um, where we can both live together in harmony. Yep. Very cool. Yeah. So I feel like a good way to start this off right here might be to look at the five living species of rhinoceros. So let's lay some groundwork first. What are these animals that are around today? How many are there? Let's talk about it. And the poaching is for the horns, Caravan, unfortunately. Yes. All right. Ceratotherium. Can anybody tell me what that name means? Ceratotherium. Ooh, we've got two really nice root words there. If you know a thing or two about paleontology, then you might know what that means. What does that mean? Well, you're close, Javasaurus. You're close. Diagonal, or it, shoot, diagonal. Ding, ding, ding. You got it. Yes, indeed. Yeah. Uh, that was real quick. I'm impressed. Um, 
serrato, this means horned, like triceratops, serrat means horned, ceratosaurus means horned lizard, therium is a suffix that you see in a lot of ancient mammal names, megatherium, um, glossotherium, Paraceratherium, which we'll talk about later, a giant rhinoceros, the largest land-living mammal to have ever lived. Paraceratherium. Therium means beast. Just in the same way that Saurus is kind of like the traditional, almost universal suffix for dinosaur names. You know, Ceratosaurus, Tyrannosaurus, uh, Edmontosaurus. Cetacosaurus, etc. Saurus means lizard, lizard or reptile. Therium means beast. And so reptile or lizard, Saurus, is kind of traditional for dinosaurs. Therium is kind of the traditional suffix for ancient mammals. Therium, beast. So Ceratotherium, horned beast. Yeah. So there's the white rhino right there, or wide rhino. See that wide? Oh, this is this is where they live. That wide mouth on it. Yeah, the black rhino, Diceros. It's interesting. That's actually a different genus. Diceros. Can anybody tell me what this means? That last one is actually a clue. Diceros. And actually, th this is also. It's funny. This and this mean the same thing. Yeah. Jody Fish. It means two horn. Yeah, two horn, two horn. There you go, Claire Burr. Yes, indeed. That's what that means. Diceros bicornus. But I repeat myself. It's the same thing. Two horn, two horn. Yeah. Someone got bored that day. There you go, Jody Fish. Yeah. <laughs> That's the geographic range of the black rhino with the pointy mouth. Yeah. And then we get into the lesser known rhinoceros. Many of you may not realize that rhinoceros also live on the Indian subcontinent. And then there's a couple that actually live even further east too, but let's take a look at the Indian rhinoceros here. Yeah. And diagonal, that is interesting. There's some interesting expertise there from diagonal. Diagonal says, Diceros is Greek, Bicornus is Latin. I did not know that. Very cool. Um, so, Latin, Greek. Two horn, two horn. First, oh, sorry. Greek, Latin. First is Greek, second is Latin. That's that's pretty cool, diagonal. That's really neat. Yeah, the Sumatran rhinoceros and, yeah, and the, uh, the Javan rhinoceros are the ones we're going to talk about next. But here is the Indian rhinoceros. What a beautiful animal. They're so cool. They are so neat. And look at their geographic range. Oh. Uh, oh, that makes me sad. So this is this is India right here. And then we've got, I think, Bangladesh over here. And anyway, look at their just tiny, tiny little pockets of territory. The only places where they're living today. It is... That is deeply sad. It really is. Yeah. Such a, a beautiful, incredible animal. And they're confined to such small geographic ranges. That's nuts. Uh, yeah. Although, Bag of Silly, how are you doing? How is this your first time in the chat? That can't be right. Bag of Silly, how are you doing? Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you? It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, Bag of Silly. I've seen you in Lordy's chat many, many times. It's it's good to have you here. Yeah. You lurky, but don't usually chat. Well, I appreciate you chatting. Hello, Bag of Silly. Do you, do you love rhinos as much as I do? 
Welcome. Happy World Rhino Day to you. I'm glad you could join us. And the Sumatran Rhinoceros. There we go. Yeah. These are extraordinarily rare animals. And they are only known from here, 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 and here. This is a real problem with um with conserving animals like this is that you get the ranges of the these animals used to be over these entire islands. I want you to know that right now. So uh Sumatra is um Is that Indonesia or is that Malaysia? Shoot, somebody in the chat let me know. Sumatra is one of the islands in Indonesia. Thank you, Gimpleg. Okay, the Javan rhinoceros, also from Indonesia. Um, But anyway, these critters, I'm sure, used to roam throughout these entire islands here. And now they've been restricted to these tiny, tiny little plots. It's not, it's not just poaching. It's people, like, actively killing these animals that has decreased their numbers to this point. It's also habitat destruction. So, yeah. Yeah. And the thing is, in in the history of life on Earth, when we look at the fossil history of different organisms, when we look at different animals evolving through time, animals or other organisms, plants and fungi and other organisms too, they can speciate, turn into new species when there are distinct populations that are cut off. There's no gene flow. And so the gene flow between here and here and here and here and here, these animals cannot interbreed because their habitat is cut off. They're just these tiny little postage stamps of habitat there. And that's not good. You know, you have inbreeding. You won't have gene flow between these different populations, and that's really, really bad for their genetic health. So, yeah. Majavan rhinoceros. Let's protect our fossils, because if they're removed... And Pegley. America loses them forever. Holy cow, Pegley, thank you for subscribing. Welcome to the channel. Welcome to the community. Thanks for keeping me here on the air. Enjoy those gift subs. I hope I enjoy those gift subs. Enjoy those emotes. Emotes like these and these and these and these and these. Use them only for good, for they are powerful. No, use them however you like on Twitch. Everybody loves dinosaur emotes. Spam them all willy-nilly. Anyhow, ad was running, ruining the info. Well, I appreciate you, Pegley. And Jody Fish. Thank you for that. Thank you, Jody Fish, very, very much for those five gift subs. That is lovely, and I really appreciate it, Jody Fish. Thank you, thank you. Only 20 to go. If they're removed, America loses them forever. And Bag of Silly, thank you. Holy cow. Thank you for subscribing, Bag of Silly. It's wonderful to have you here. Thank you for subscribing, Bag of Silly. Thanks for that that commitment to, to further support over the months and and months and months. Nobody ever achieves a full year here. It's kind of a running joke. But um, anyway, I appreciate that, Bagasilli. Welcome to the community. Thanks for taking the plunge. Appreciate you. Bag of Dinosaur, there you go. Yeah. Ah, <laughs> uh, let's talk about the Javan rhinoceros, perhaps my favorite species of living rhino. They are such beautiful animals. The Javan rhinoceros. Also, I think the rarest living rhinoceros. They're kind of a little mini rhino. And look 
at their geographic range, just on this tiny little peninsula right here in on the island of Java in Indonesia. That's incredible. They basically occupy a territory the size of, like, I don't know. Battery Park in New York City, maybe? Or certainly a lot smaller than the San Francisco Presidio or Golden Gate Park. That's like a tiny, tiny little peninsula. It's it's nuts. A U.S. county smaller than that, I think, Caravan. Smaller than that. That's crazy. Yeah. Oh, man. The Javan rhinoceros. Yeah, the Javan rhinoceros, their population, or at least seven years ago, was something between 58 and 61 individuals in the wild. I think it's maybe half that right now. Uh, let's, let's take a look at the Javan rhinoceros. Take a look at this. Oh, look at that little baby. Uh... Look at this incredible animal. Oh, that's something that we're going to talk about in a little while. So, rhinoceros are part of the group of creatures that we call odd toed ungulates. So, ungulates are hoofed mammals, and the ones that have odd toes, it's not like the toes look odd, although maybe they look odd to you, I don't know. And so, they have an odd number of toes. They either have three or they have one. Rhinoceros and tapirs have three. Horses have one. These creatures are called perissodactyls. And shoot, let's let's just talk about that right now, real quick. Um, here we go. Let's go to ungulata or ungulates. Damn oh boy. All right, well, first let's go to the cloven-hoofed ungulates. The even-toed ungulates are in uh, in here. There we go. But here it... Oh. That's not quite right. Whatever. Um... Anyway, hoofed mammals are called ungulates. Here. Ungulata. Ungulates are all of these wonderful animals with hooves. You know, like giraffes and elk and bison and camels and pigs and rhinos. Zebras and tapirs and whales? Yes, whales are themselves hoofed mammals. They are ungulates. Whales, first of all, from land living hoofed mammals like Pachycetus here. And then over tens of millions of years, they developed more aquatic habits like this. Became better and better adapted to life in the sea, like with Cuchycetus here. Basically like a giant killer otter from hell. From such inauspicious beginnings, they eventually grew to be the largest mammals to have ever lived. But first, they went through stages like Dorudan right here. Yeah. Yeah, 
A what, Cetus? Pakistanis from Pakistan. Um, yeah. There we go. This doesn't really show the full extent of things, but, uh... Yeah. Here, is this... Real Evolution in two minutes? This is this the same one? Oh, this is gonna be cool. Yeah, from indo a small hoofed mammal. Here, we'll use our own music. Surf music, I think, is appropriate for this. Hang ten, you little hoofed mammals. As you evolve into... Yeah, Remington Acetas. Evolve into full-fledged whales as we recognize them today. My Acetas, mother whale. That's what that name means. Good stuff. Yeah, Rhodocetus. Georgiacetus. Really important one there, Georgiacetus, from the U.S. state of Georgia. Dorudon, like we saw in the other video. That was the one that the other video ended on. And Basilosaurus. Not a dinosaur, not a reptile at all, but a mammal. And Mammalodon. Obviously a mammal, too. <laughs> These are all mammals. Jonjucetus. You can see them becoming more and more similar to modern whales as we get closer to the present. Adiocetus. Eomysticus. Eomysticetus, excuse me, an early baleen whale. That almost looks like a great whale there. Cetotherium. The whale beast. There's that therium suffix again. And then Balenoptera musculus, the modern blue whale. Humpback whale. There we go. Right there. So, uh... Anyway, hang hoof. There you go, Bradington. Yeah, I like that. And Ambulicetus means walking whale. Yes, indeed. That's such a cool name. Ambulicetus. That's one of the greatest names, I think, in vertebrate paleontology. It really is. It's so cool. Anyway, all of this to show that whales... Including the orca here, killer whale, which is an odonto seat whale, along with dolphins and sperm whales, orcas, they're all odonto seat whales. Um, they are ungulates, hoofed mammals. But the thing is, the, uh, where's our even toed ungulates? Yeah, cloven-hoofed ungulates, or even-toed ungulates. So-called because they have an even number of toes. They either have two or four. Uh, hippos have four, and all the rest of these critters have two. Except for whales. They don't, don't have any anymore. Anyway, Cetariodactyla. Used to be called Artiodactyla, and then we realized whales were part of this too. So it got changed to Cetariodactyla. Rhinos do not belong to this group. They belong to the other group of hoofed mammals. There's two main groups. There's this group, the cloven hoofed ungulates, or even toed ungulates, because they have either four or two toes. But rhinos and tapirs and horses. There we go. Are perissodactyls. They have an odd number of toes, either one or three. Horses and zebras just have one. They're part of equidae. But rhinos and tapirs, they have got three toes. Three. I can count. I'm a scientist. So yeah, perissodactyls, there you go. Yeah. And my mind is now going down a rabbit hole. I wix starts. Well, awesome. Yeah. So dolphins had even toes and whale. No, dolphin. So grilled Pikachu. Do Dolph dolphins are a kind of whale. I think this is a lot of confusing for. Uh, this is confusing for a lot of people, because sometimes a lot of science outreach is kind of low quality, to be honest. Um. Whales are a kind of... Uh, dolphins are a kind of whale. They're part of 
cetacea. So let's, uh, let's scoot out a little bit. Let's go to cetacea. Whales, dolphins, porpoises. Yep. Well, shoot, that's... Dolphins and porpoises are a kind of whale, but yeah, there you go. Cetacea, they all belong to the same group. Um, so dolphins, porpoises, orcas, narwhals, beaked whales, etc. They're all whales. Yeah. Whales are not a kind of horse, Brennington. No, horses are odd-toed ungulates. These guys are even-toed ungulates. So you, you zoom out a little bit from them... And you get to this group, which I'm sure has a name, but they don't list the name here. Hippos are part of this group, too. You zoom out a little bit further. And you get to... Cetaria dactyla when you get to... Well, there you go. Pigs, dolphins, giraffes, moose, etc. Yeah. Horses, you got to go back further to get the horses. Cetariodactyla. And... Oh, I'm sorry, what? Yeah, from here you get to the cloven hoofed ungulates. Hang on, what? That's odd. Where's our odd toad ungulates? Boroeutheria. Man, I wish Fisher were here right now. He knows about this. Caranta. Anyway. That's how dinosaurs are. Unpredictable. It's true. Rhinos can also be unpredictable. Bits can make Thank you, Odd Job, for the 26 months. The appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. And Ash Rubber, thank you for the thousand bits there. Computer mouse. I, I really like my computer mouse, Ash Rubber. What do you mean? Um, shoot, look at it. It's made of wood. How cool is that? I mean, look at that. My keyboard is also made of wood. Yeah. It was giving you scroll issues? That's fine. You know? I don't have to use the scroll wheel. I can just click the little bar on the side and scooch it up and down. That's okay. I, I really like my mouse, but I will... I will use those thousand bits for something else that I need ash rubber, and I appreciate you for it. Thank you very much. Yeah. Looks cool, scrolls bad. Yeah, that's true. Um, it is a pain in the butt sometimes, but... Because, like, I'll, I'll scroll in one direction, and it'll, it'll go in the other direction. But that's okay. Yeah. They're not sold separately, Clearbird. They're sold as a, as a group. They're synced together. Anyway, how did we get on this in the first place? We were talking about... Rhino hooves. Yeah. Um, let's... Let's talk. Do pandas try to eat your hardware? You know, I've not really had... I've not seen too many pandas here in the San Francisco Bay Area. Yeah. Um, but anyway. Javan rhinoceros. My favorite rhinos alive today. Look at this beautiful animal. Despite growing to a length of two and a half meters and weighing it. They're the smallest one. Oh. Uh.
fewer than 80 of them. Imagine if your whole spe imagine if there are fewer than 80 people left in the entire world. That's nuts. That's nuts. Yeah. Uh Oh, look at these animals. And yeah, not a lot of genetic material to work with. You're right. Yeah. Uh. Huh. They seem to gather toward the fences, so. Rat to. Oh. Uh. Oh wow. <gasps> oh. <laughs> Wow. Oh. Huh. It's like four years between offspring, something like that, Jody Fish, yeah. Yeah, these are not animals that reproduce very frequently. Yeah, let's take a look at this right here. This is some of the only footage of this rare rhino in the wild. And here, we're going to use our own music. The Javan rhinoceros is one of the rarest large mammals on the planet. Uh, Javan rhinos have been poached for their horns, nearly wiping out the species. The entire population, estimated to be only 73 left in the wild, are protected in the Ujung Kulong National Park on the western tip of Java, Indonesia. Just last month, cons conservationists found a snare meant for the Javan rhino. Ugh. There's a huge concern that the poachers will come back. Let's take a look at this from the World Wildlife Fund. Again, 
just music here. Here it says they're only 67. I guess we're getting closer to the present in time. Uh... Their food source is being threatened by the Aggressa Arenga Palm, which probably has to do with palm oil, doesn't it? Uh, which is growing out of control in critical rhino habit. Desperate and hungry, these rhinos are clinging to survival. With your help, we've already defended them against poaching and illegal logging. This is the World Wildlife Fund here. But we need to continue the fight to keep this tiny population alive. This is this is the thing. When we're talking about these animals, this is a group of creatures that has survived for tens of millions of years, and they're... It's because of us knuckleheads, you know, human beings, that they're now on the brink of extinction. Here we go. The Javan rhinoceros here on Wikipedia. They are critically endangered. The decline of the Javan rhinoceros is attributed to poaching, primarily for its horns, which are highly valued in traditional Chinese medicine, which is heartbreaking. Because that's so incredibly misguided. Chinese tra Chinese traditional medicine is neither Chinese, nor is it traditional, nor is it medicine. It's a complete and total scam. You know what it reminds me of, honestly? It reminds me of this right here. Ah, not a bear in sight. The bear patrol must be working like a charm. That's specious reasoning, Dad. Thank you, honey. By your logic, I could claim that this rock keeps tigers away. Oh, how does it work? It doesn't work. Uh -huh. It's just a stupid rock. Uh-huh. But I don't see any tigers around here, do you? Lisa, I want to buy your rock. Yeah. Same deal. You know? <laughs> it's just keratin. It's literally... You could eat toenails, and it would do the same thing as, as, you know, rhino horn. It would frankly be less gross. Anyway. Yeah. Uh. So, yeah. Yeah, anyway. Back to this here. Whoop. So rhinoceros horn can fetch as much as US $30,000 per kilogram on the black market. That is disgusting. You know? At... It doesn't... It's keratin! I don't know. Sometimes when... This sort of thing really gets my goat. Really makes me angry. Because it's like... You wonder sometimes... I don't know, I've had people tell me like, Well, you know, Danny, what do you care if people believe in things that aren't true? If people believe in... 
you know, magical fantasies or, you know, hocus pocus nonsense. You know, what, what do you, what, what do you care? What is it? What does it really matter in the grand scheme of things? You know, people believe what they want to believe. This is why it's important. You know, when people believe things that are wildly untrue, it leads to nonsense like this. Where people are, are spending untold amounts of money on basically what amounts to, like, fingernails to grind up into traditional medicine, which is not traditional and it's not medicine. Chinese traditional medicine was born in the 1950s under Mao Zedong. It's not... It does not go back centuries. It's a new thing, and it doesn't work. Anyway, there's an old saying that if you can get people to believe in absurdities, you can get them to commit atrocities. And that's exactly what is happening right here with these remarkable animals. They're being driven to extinction. These remarkable creatures will be gone from the Earth if this sort of thing continues. And it's because people are stupid. Uh, there, I'm sorry, there's like no other better way to put that. I, or maybe there is, I don't know. I'm just, I'm hot and bothered right now and I apologize. Anyway. <sighs> a fun video about rhinos? Let's take a look at that. Thank you, Miss Yvette. Thank you. These are white rhinos. What is a rhinoceros? Hmm, I don't know. Pretty much a nice kind of animal. Brown <laughs> and it has. A... No, they're gray. I think but that's they have okay. Two I think they live in Africa. Four Some legs. of them do. They, they do. Eat, like, they do all have four legs. They're smaller. Each. I think rhinos eat vegetables. A rhinoceros is a horned mammal. Which She's one right. Of these photos is a rhinoceros. Oh, but what is wrong with this poor... This looks like Nidoceratops. <laughs> that poor, diseased Triceratops specimen. That's what this reminds me of right here. Uh, that's a white rhino right there. Or a wide rhino. See the wide mouth? Yeah. yeah. That's right. What does yeah. rhinoceros mean? Need a hint? It means nose horn. Plain as the nose on their face. The word rhinoceros is a combination of two Greek words. Yep. Rhino, meaning nose, and seros, meaning horn. Bingo. A few other species share this nose horn characteristic. They also have the word rhinoceros. Oh, and hang on. Um, No, white rhinos are not extinct, pimp cat, uh, or flying spaghetti monster. It's, uh, I think it's the northern white rhino. There are two surviving members of that species that are known, both in captivity. Um, yeah. Is that right, Nell? I think so. Yeah. In their name, too. The rhinoceros beetle, rhinoceros hornbill, rhinoceros yep. iguana, and the rhinoceros viper. Yeah, nose horn. But there's only one animal that's just called a rhinoceros. Did you know? Well, there are five species five today. Different types of rhinos. Yep. Here at the San Diego Zoo Safari Park, southern white, black, and greater one horn rhinos live in heat. which i think greater one-horned rhino i think is also the indian rhinoceros right this looks to me like an indian rhinoceros correct me if i'm wrong but i think that's the case southern white black and greater one-horned rhinos live in heat. and again notice how the southern white and black rhinoceros they're the same color southern you know white rhinoceros black rhinoceros same color don't let that fool you, chat. Don't let that fool you. Southern white, black. See? Same color. Kind of a brownish gray. And greater one horn rhinos. Also brownish gray. Huge field exhibit. Yeah. And wide in Afrikaans. That makes a lot of sense now. Because we were talking about wide, like the wide mouth of the white rhino. There you go. 
who named this these things Afrikaners, you know? So, well, you know. Is there anything cuter than a baby rhino? I don't know. It's hard to it's hard to say, S.V. Harkin. Look at these remarkable animals. The white rhino is the largest rhino species. They can grow to weigh largest more living rhino than species. 5,000 pounds. Next in size is the Indian or greater one-horned rhino. Bingo! I was correct right there. Yeah, so the greater one-horned rhino, also known as the Indian rhinoceros. I like to say Indian rhinoceros because it... Well, it's kind of self-explanatory. They're the ones from India. Which may stand yeah. taller than a white rhino, but their bodies weigh just a little less. So, huh. the greater one-horned rhino is the tallest, then the white rhino, oh. next is the black rhino, That's then interesting. The and last but not least, the Sumatran rhino is the I... smallest. Hang on, I thought the Javan rhinoceros was the smallest. That's what Wikipedia said, right? Is there a lesser one-horned rhino? I, I don't know, Mayor Space. That's a good question. I'm not sure. Weighing in at less than 2,000 pounds. but Less than 2,000 pounds? Wow, I weigh like 1,000 pounds more than that. Wait, no, that's not right. Anyway, they are small. But it has something for, their by rhino standards. Don't. Hair all over their body. Black rhinos and white rhinos live in Africa, while greater one-horned, Javan, and Sumatran rhinos make their home on the continent of Asia. Uh, no, that's not actually correct. That's not, that's not true. This would make you think that Sumatran rhinos live in, like, Ukraine, and greater one-horned rhinos live in Russia, and Javan rhinoceros live in... I don't know, China? They used to live in China. They don't anymore. Um, Javan rhinoceros and Sumatran rhinoceros live down here in Indonesia. Um, down here. Greater one-horned rhinos live in India right here. So that... This is not her fault, not the narrator's fault, but whoever is editing together this video really, really pooched this one. That's not... That's not great. Sumatran, black and white rhinos have two horns, while Javan and greater one-horned rhinos have, you guessed it, one horn. How many toes does a rhino have? Hang on a minute. Wait, they have three. Do do Sumatran rhinos have two horns? Did she just, is that, did I miss that? On the continent of Asia. Sumatran, uh. black and white rhinos have two horns. And Javan rhinos Javan have one horn? And greater one-horned rhinos is that is that right too? She didn't show the editor didn't show a Javan rhino. I thought they can have two, but they can. I guess it's only one. I guess that's what distinguishes a Sumatran and a Javan rhino. Yeah. And they used a Mercator projection for their map. Oh no, Mayor of Space. Oh no. A Mercator projection? How could they? I actually really like the Mercator projection for uh, for certain things, but it does definitely... I took some cartography classes in college, and, and, you know, there's three different things. You can have size, distance, and direction, and you've got to make a balancing act with all of these. Mercator projections do not preserve size very well. They make Places like Greenland look very big, and places like Africa look very small. Um, but uh, they do preserve distance pretty well, I think. Um, I think it's distance and direction they preserve, but not size. There are other projections that preserve uh, size and, and direction, but not distance, etc. So anyway, yeah. Uh, where were we? Shoot, let's go back to here. Javan and Greater yeah. One Horn Oh, and shape. Shoot, that's another one, Thalo. Sorry. One How many toes does a rhino have? Three. Three. 
because of their odd number of toes. They're called perissodactyls. Yeah. Are tapirs, horses, and zebras. And no, that's well, that's kind of exactly backwards. Again, we're really picking some nits right here. We're we're going in. And we're picking those nits with some very fine tweezers. But uh, that's not why they're related to tapirs and horses. They are related to tapirs and horses, and thus they have an odd number of toes because they are perissodactyls. Because they evolved from the same ancestor, that's why they've got an odd number of toes. So it's... Yes, but no. Anyway. An adult white rhino can produce as much as 50 pounds of dung per day. That's a... Yeah, and early horses had more toes. This is very true, Diagonal. And we'll, we might be talking about that later when we show another video on perissodactyls, but yeah. Yeah, and like a clave? What's a clave, freelancer? I'm not sure. Yeah. Lot of poop. The smell of each rhino. The Wonkel Trippel projection. Is that a is that a real one, Mayor Space? That's not named after Kathy Wonkel of Wonkel Rex fame, is it? <laughs> Uh, I did have, my, my cartography professor did have a favorite projection. I don't remember what it was, but, um, Opine yeah. Is unique to its owner. The newest edition. Winkle, not Wonkle. Oh, okay. Arrived. She began introductions by checking out the like the fawns. Or communal dung piles to get to know everyone. Then she joined the party. Hmm. What a remarkable the animals. They're so cool. It's called a craft. That's not true. That's, uh, that's literally not true. Oh, boy, this is one of those things that, do I need to tap the sign again? Do I have to tap the sign again? Hi, Larry. I'm sorry, it's just that on the school bus. <laughs> May I have that seat? <laughs> yes, if you can answer me these questions three. Question the first. Never mind. Um, excuse me, sir. When does this bus get to the museum? It doesn't. Oh, but isn't this the 22? Yeah, Monday, Wednesday, Friday. Tuesday, Thursday is the 22A. 22A? Then where the heck am I? Don't make me tap the sign. <laughs> anyway, don't make me tap the sign. There we go. Don't make me tap the sign again. No, it's not actually a murder of crows. You've all heard them before somewhere. And a bad poem, maybe, or as part of an online clickbaity slideshow. Do you know what a, a group of owls is called a parliament? Do you know that a group of jellyfish is called a smack? Did you know that a group of Indonesian mountain weasels is called a bubblegum? I made that last one up, but how would you know? As familiar as they are, these little nicknames for groups of animals, in terms of venery, if you want to get fancy with it, are supposedly delightful quirks of the English language. They've always left me feeling annoyed. Annoyed because, as a lifelong birder, I've never once used parliament for owls, or murder for crows, or anything of the sort. Or heard anyone else use them. Wow, is that the dinosaur room? Just look at that thing. It's not going to be friendly to us. Dr. Irrefutable... Thank you for the five months right there. How can that be? Thanks for all the great streams. I appreciate you, Dr. Irrefutable. I appreciate you very, very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um. 
Yeah. Anyway, a wisdom of wombats. It's not actually true wombat hole. Yeah. I needed to know, are there actual people in the real world who use special names for certain species? Or is there just one nerd in an office somewhere with a field guide in one hand and a dictionary in the other, matching each species with a cute little term and laughing maniacally when the world collectively coos over the pairing? I needed to ask those closest to the source. I needed to talk to some scientists. Have you ever referred to a group of vultures as a venue? Dr. Keith L. Bildstein. Sarkis Acopian Director of Conservation Science, Hawk Mountain Sanctuary. No, I have not. Have you ever used the term chain for a group of bobo links? Dr. Noah Perlute, bobo link researcher, University of New England. I've now studied bobo links intensively for 14 years, and no, I've not heard it. Have you ever called a group of woodcocks a fall? Jake Walker studied woodcocks for his master's thesis at Trent University, Ontario. I uh, sure as hell would never say, never say it, nor have I ever heard it said. Do you ever use the term rumba of rattlesnakes, congress of salamanders, basque of crocodiles, generation of vipers? Dr. David Steen, reptile expert, Auburn University. I've never used any of these and would have no idea what someone was talking about if I ever heard them. Anyway, so these different, like, cutesy names for different groups of animals? Not actually used by the people who care about these animals, the people who study them. You know, scientists? So yeah, a Roomba of rattlesnakes. Yeah, there you go, Jody Fitch. Uh, so a group of rhinoceros not actually called a crash. At least I've never heard anybody say this. You could email some, uh, or on Twitter maybe if you find some some, uh, Rhinoceros researchers, you could ask them, like, a group of, of rhinoceros, do you call them a crash? You call them a herd. You know, it's a generic term. People know what you're talking about. A group of rhinoceros yeah. is called a crash. I highly doubt that anybody who actually studies rhinoceros would ever use this term in real life or in a scientific paper or anywhere like that, you know? Yeah. Anyway. Yeah. And, uh, what's a group of paleontologists called, SB? Um, I don't know. A group of paleontologists. <laughs> That's what you call them, you know? Uh, or when they gather once a year, if they're vertebrate paleontologists, they gather once a year into a, a special ritual. Let's see. Uh, yeah. You call them, uh... And toss a coin to your Twitcher. Welcome to Paleontologizing. It's good to have you here. Thanks for joining us. Uh, what do you call a group of paleontologists? You call them... Uh, an SVP. If they're vertebrate paleontologists, at least, you call them a society of vertebrate paleontologists. Yeah. That's funny. I know a lot of these people. Creatures you might think of as inhabiting another planet. Or the kind you dream of in a bad nightmare. So, Spartan, thank you for the 37 months. Appreciate that. This, you can call this a party. There's, there's... Nate Carroll right there. I know Nate. Curator of the Carter County Museum in Ekalaka, Montana. Nate's a good guy. There he is. He's he's quite the dancer. One of these days, we're going to bring him on, hopefully, for an interview. He got his PhD recently. And, uh... Hang on. Who is that? Um, shoot. I know her. Darn it. Um... Sorry, it's been a long day, everybody. Um, that's Jingmei O'Connor right there. Jingmei. Yeah, she's quite the dancer, too. Anyway, I, unfortunately, will not be attending 
the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting this year in Cincinnati. I'll be missing it again. And this year, it's because instead... I... will be attending TwitchCon this year. So if you'd like to meet me in person, if you're going to TwitchCon, you're probably going to see me there. I and a group of other scientists and science communicators will be holding a special panel discussion. There we go. At TwitchCon this year, the Scientific Method Twitch Edition. Talking about what it means to do science on Twitch and how we do science outreach on this platform. Pretty cool, so I'm very excited about that. Unfortunately, TwitchCon and SVP, the Society of Vertebrate Paleontology meeting, are on the same weekend, 52 weekends out of the year, and it has to be the same weekend. So anyway. Yeah. I'll be going to TwitchCon, because it's going to be a lot cheaper than going to uh, a scientific meeting, unfortunately. No, we do not get paid to go to scientific meetings. In fact, we've got to pay thousands of dollars in order to do it. It's a broken system. But, um... Anyway. Yeah, rolled a critical miss. There you go, freelancer. Yeah. Yeah. And Neon Coffee Cat says, How are people selected for this? Well, shoot, since this panel discussion was my idea some of them were chosen by me and some of them were chosen by uh, Belint from Cyant Streams we actually collaborated on this we uh, we colluded on this there was some collusion but uh yeah uh, attendees of the panel are Volcano Doc who herself is a volcanologist a volcano scientist Cyant Streams that's Belint right there this. I've never heard of this person. What? Nicotine is our moderator for the panel. She's our host. Uh, she's a prominent streamer. Nerduino is a science communicator, former NASA scientist. Moohoodles is a science communicator. She does uh, uh, astronomy, science outreach. Good stuff. Anyway. Uh... Yeah. Follow these people right now. Scientists on Twitch doing cheap. good work. Try blaming the dinosaurs. Hi, oh, I often do, Lordy. How are you doing, Lordy? Welcome, welcome. It's good to see you. Thanks for those hundred bits. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Yeah. Let's let's get back to our our rhinos video. So far, a few things about this that aren't true. I don't think anybody actually calls a group of rhinoceros a crash. These are largely solitary animals. They don't really form groups very often. But, I don't know. You'd call them a herd of rhinoceros. Animals usually don't actually have cutesy nicknames for uh, groups of them. But yeah. Yeah. You can tell which species of rhino eats what kind of food by looking at their mouth. Really spectacular. Spared no expense. And Lordy, Don't thank you for that gift sub there. Sub to the I appreciate that very much, really Lordy. Thank you, thank no you. Expense. And Miss Yvette, thank you for that gift sub. Look. We are only 16 subs away from our weekly goal. Holy cow, that's only two eights or four fours. Or one fifteen and one one. Anyway, we could that get that uke today. We could, Lordy. We could. We could. Greater one horn and black rhinos have a hooked prehensile top lip that's yeah. great for grasping and browsing. Look at that. The white rhino, on the other hand, has a wide, flat upper lip that's perfect for great. In at number eight, we have the Tradoon. Tradoon. The Tradoon. 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 Maximum darnage. 15 Tradoon. months of support from you. Thank you Tradoon. very, very much. It's good to have you here, Maximum Dog. Thank you kindly. Yeah. Rhinos may look tough, but they're. And actually, this is this is interesting because the two different mouths of these, uh, these different kinds of rhinoceros, the 
uh, black rhino and white rhino, or white. When you hear white rhino, think wide rhino because I've got a wide mouth. But um, yeah. So this is like the difference between browsers and grazers, kind of. And we think. Can I find an image with this, or maybe not? I don't know. Um, shoot, probably not. But there's two different groups of, of duck-billed dinosaurs. Yeah. Lambiosaurines and Sauralophines, which used to be called Hadrosaurians, Hadrosaurines. Hadrosaurines tend to have wider mouths, now known as Sauralophines, wider mouths. For grazing, they're just kind of, you know, and they're just kind of eating whatever. Really wide mouth, just shoveling food into their mouths. These guys have got narrower mouths for grasping and browsing. For browsing, they're a little bit more choosy. So a narrower mouth, you can kind of pick up smaller items, eat more precise bits of plants and what have you. Yeah, um, a wider mouth, you're just kind of eating whatever. The other hand has a wide, flat upper lip that's perfect yeah. for grazing. Rhinos may look tough, but their skin is actually quite sensitive. And, uh, yeah, browsers and grazers are different things. I'm just going to show On Yeah, there you go. That's That was my point, Dex, yeah. That, uh, this is the, uh, different different foraging strategies. Browsers, you know, you browse. You got a narrow mouth, you kind of, you know, eat a little bit of this, eat a little bit of that. Grazers, it's just like, give me that grass. Let me just shovel it in there. I've got a big wide mouth. Like this. Rhino, on the other hand, has a wide, flat yep. upper lip that's perfect for grazing. Yep. Rhinos may look tough, but their skin is actually quite sensitive. They can sunburn. That's why they like to mud. It puts a nice huh. protective layer on their skin. Yeah. Cool. Different rhino species definitely have different personalities. <laughs> Black rhinos need to be fierce. Huh. Because they're solitary, which means they live alone. Unlike white. Ah, this is interesting. Oftentimes, browsing creatures kind of live by themselves. Because they're, you know, they got to go off and, you know, browsing creatures who've got those narrow mouths like this right here. Hello. Prehensile lip. Prehensile top lip. That's great for grasping and browsing. So they're eating specific things. They're kind of off on their own, scouting around, just, you know, they're being really choosy about what they eat. Whereas grazers, like our uh, white rhino. Lip. That's perfect for grazing. So these guys are the more social ones because there's just a big row of them standing there, big group, and they're walking around just eating grass. They're more social. Your browsers, they're much more choosy. They're off by themselves eating particular things. Spartan, thank you for those gift subs. So Spartan. Spartan. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate cheated, that tremendously. The dinosaurs. And thank you, Pimpcat, for those 100 bits. Lovely. Look, we're now at 140 out of 150 for the week. We're only 10 subs away from our weekly goal. We are close indeed to some ukulele, Lordy. Holy cow. Yes. Yeah. Um. Good stuff. And Dex Phantom says difference between cow and elephant, grazer versus browser. So cows are definitely grazers. Elephants, elephants are also grazers too. It's more the difference between mammoths and mastodons. Or think about think about like a horse versus a deer. Here, um. Razor versus browser. Um, let's take a look at this. Maybe this. Ranger insights. Well, well, well. 
No closed captions on this, unfortunately. But herbivores can be broadly classified as either grazers or browsers, although many species do both. Yeah. Grazers like buffalo depend on the grass and low-growing plants for their nutrition. So this is cows, too, are grazers. Browsers like the giraffe have a diet based around leaves and high-growing plants. So they're kind of more picky about what they eat. They're more choosy. Yeah. Most browsers have long necks to reach vegetation that is high. Not all of them, though. I mean, black rhinos are more browsy than they are grazy. Yeah. And these are not these are not taxonomic groups. I want to make that very clear. This is not like different groups of animals that are, you know, like, well, grazers evolved from this group and browsers evolved from that. No, these are like general terms. These are like ways to... It's kind of like, uh, think about it like different kinds of car. You got SUVs, you got trucks, you got sedans, you've got coupes. Think about, you know... A, bra a browser is like a coupe, and a, a grazer is like a sedan or something like that. You know, it doesn't mean that they're related to one another. It's just like different ways to kind of categorize them based on what they're like or what they do, you know? Or hatchbacks versus coupe versus uh, sedans. There you go, freelancer. Sure, whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah. And behaviors. Yeah, there you go, Spartan. This is kind of a way to categorize them by behavior rather than actually what they are, you know, what they're related to or whatever. So, yeah, these are all grazers here. And this video is not very helpful. Shoot. Um, let's take a look at this. Maybe this will be good. Welcome to Nature's Cafe. The vegetarian menu here sports an amazing variety of grasses and forbs and shrubs and trees. Ooh, tasty, tasty. Now how does a plant-eating animal choose from all these many options? It's been a while since I've had a good well, forb. Well, it depends on what animal we're talking about, and they are all well-equipped to deal with their decision. Cattle and elk are grazers. The majority of their diet comes from grasses. Yep. Grasses have thick cell walls, which take time to break down. So cattle and elk have big, wide mouths and a slow but very efficient digestive system. So there you go, wide mouth, like the white or wide rhino. You got that? So cattle and elk have big, wide, Here. thick cell walls, which take time to break down. So cattle and elk have big, wide mouths. and Wide mouths are characteristic of animals that employ a grazing strategy. You know? I should use that term grazing strategy. You're eating a lot of food. And you're eating uh, uh, big quantities of kind of low-quality food. That's, a, that's grazing. In a slow but very efficient digestive system. Yeah. Way, they can eat a lot of grass and extract all the nutrients. So, yeah, that's your white rhino or wide rhino because it's got a big, wide mouth. Yeah. Pronghorns, deer, and goats are browsers. The majority yep. of their diets are made up of forbs, shrubs, and trees. In particular, they tend to... And holy cow, iconic song. Tinamus, these would be browsers. Got a very narrow mouth. And look how happy this bird is for those 10 gift subs. I... Uh-oh. Oh, shoot. Iconic song is overloading the system with 10 gift subs. Thank you, Iconic Song. Do I appreciate that? Thank you, thank you. That's excellent. Yeah. And we'll be getting some Iconic Songs in a little bit. Thank you. We have reached our sub goal for this week. Extraordinary. Holy cow. Really, really... Thank you, thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. 
We reached our sub goal for this week. Thank you, Iconic Song. Good stuff. Thanks for keeping me here on the air. We'll do some ukulele songs in a little bit. But, uh... I want to continue with this. This can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Tooch. Ariel, thank you for those thousand bits. I appreciate that very much. Thank you, thank you. That is extraordinary. Thank you, kind. Thank you, gift sub givers. And bit cheerers, I appreciate you very much. Lovely. Anyway, browsers and grazers. Which can make a wonderful difference in promoting the appreciation and understanding of fossil science here on Twitch. Thank you, Barail. That's two thousand bits. Thank you, thank you. Holy moly. What do I even say to that? Thank you, Barail. I appreciate that very, very much. Holy cow. That is really lovely. That's like 20 ramen. No, 40. I actually bought ramen this morning at the store. 50 cents a pack. My favorite kind is, um... Um... There we go. Yeah, this is my favorite kind. I got like eight of these this morning. They're 50 cents each at the store that I went to. The only store that has these, they're 50 cents each. Um, so yeah, that's that's 40 of those right there, Barile. That's 10 meals. No, 20 meals. 20? Wait, hang on. 20 meals. Yeah. So thank you, Barile. I appreciate you. Thank you very, very much. It's 20 breakfasts right there. Yeah. Hope you add in some resh vegetables, says SV Hargan. I don't have any resh vegetables where I live. Oh. <laughs> but yeah. Yeah. Anyway. That's good stuff. Resh vegetables. <laughs> I get those from the Scooby Doo. <laughs> Rush vegetables, Raggy. <laughs> no, you're gonna do that. Yeah, there you go. As we Hargan. I appreciate you. As we Hargan. Yeah. Anyway, um, browsers and grazers, you get all that stuff. Okay, let's let's get back to our rhinos here, and then. We'll get to our long rhino video about fossil rhinos, and then in a bit we'll get to uh, who wants to be a paleontologist. White but yeah. Rhino, on the other hand, uh, has a wide, flat upper lip that's perfect for grazing. Rhinos may look tough, but their skin is actually quite sensitive. Mm. They can sunburn. That's why they like to oh. in mud. It puts a nice protective layer on their skin and keeps them cool. Oh, they do look cool when they're like that. Yeah. Different rhino species? Definitely. We haven't done the unicorn yet. We'll do that in just a minute, Dinosaur Dave. Black rhinos need to be fierce because they're solitary, which means they live alone, unlike white rhinos that live in groups. So that's the thing, too. There we go. We were talking about browsers versus grazers. Creatures that browse, they tend to be fairly solitary. You don't normally see, like, you know, 900 deer walking around in a valley in a big herd or a uh, uh shoot what do you uh, file cabinet of deer or whatever the cutesy nickname is supposed to be for the, the thing that nobody uses you know a rolodex of deer or whatever a birthday cake of deer you don't normally see a, a herd of 500 deer or whatever but browsing uh, grazing animals excuse me you often do see in great big herds like bison a USB charger of deer. There you go, birds with that on. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. <sighs> Browsing animals tend to be more solitary. Grazing animals tend to live in great big herds. Or yeah. crashes. They rely on each other for protection. Crashes. Nobody calls them that. But yeah. Rhinos are often hunted for their horns. 
which is believed in some cultures to have medicinal uses. And it's not really even like this is uh, the idea that we have to be like culturally sensitive about something like this when it's not even actually part of any real culture is. I find that deeply, deeply frustrating. You know, in this case, Chinese traditional medicine is neither medicine, nor is it traditional, nor is it Chinese. This is something that was actually introduced from outside cultures. Made like this is basically made up in China in the 1950s under Mao Zedong. You know, it's not like they're oh, there are traditions that go back thousands of years. That's complete nonsense. Completely made up. Like it, it comes from like one book in the 1950s when China was modernizing during the Great Leaps Forward, you know, people just made stuff up in order to, like, have these country doctors who would run around with this book, and, you know, they weren't actually trained in medicine or anything, but it was like a placebo effect kind of thing. It's from the 1950s. It's not traditional. It's not medicine. It's not even Chinese in that sense. So anyway, yeah. The rhino horn is made up of keratin, which is the same thing that makes up our hair and our fingernails. Yep. Regrettably, neither human hair nor fingernails are proven to possess the healing powers that some people think are found in rhino horn. Nope. The only thing it has the power to do is to lighten your wallet. And that's exactly what it does. And people line up in droves to be fooled, to get scammed, to get scrumped. You know, they're like, take my money. I'm not very smart. Take all of it. And let's kill the rhinos. Ugh. I believe that they could chew on their own fingernails or their own hair in order yeah. to heal well and stop the needless hunting of rhinos. It's like the rich people want to be duped. It's true, Lenina, yeah. Yeah. Now you can help lead the charge to save them. There you go. Beautiful animals. I like rhinos. Rhinos are nice. Rhinos! Save the rhinos! That's really lovely. Yeah. Well, well, well. Yeah. With that having been said, let's talk about another way that people were fooled. Here, I gotta fix this light too. My battery on that just died. I'm gonna replace this with the plug-in one at some point. But, um... Yeah. Here, let's, let's take a look at this right here. The Madgeberg Unicorn. I've never seen this video before. It's from a very small channel with seven subscribers. But hopefully this will be good. It's very short. But, um, yeah. Welcome to episode one of Life's Compelling Questions. Mm. Today we're going to be taking a look into the history of the Magdeburg Unicorn. Back in 1663, near the small mountain town of Quedlinburg, Germany, a collection of fossils were unearthed in a gypsum quarry inside of a cave now known as Unicorn Cave. Along comes Otto von Guericke, a scientist as well as a mayor of a neighboring town. Hmm. This was no ordinary man, as he already had a significant achievement under his belt, that being the invention of the vacuum pump. Really? He looked at this collection That's of fossils and wrote a news article which described them as none other than the remnants of a unicorn. Modern depictions of what the unicorn could have looked like based there you on go, the construction oh look a little something like this. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, 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 yeah. So who's to blame for this abomination of a reconstruction? Hmm. Garricky's name ultimately became the one attributed with the fossil reconstruction that is so laughably bad. 
In fact, it was believed that it wasn't even until five years after the fossil's discovery that Garricky created this fossil reconstruction. Hmm. This means the mayor of this town saw a pile of bones in front of him and said, right there, that's a unicorn. Yeah, the, uh... There have been mayors of towns who've done far more foolish and ridiculous things than that. I mean, don't kid yourself. Shoot. But yeah. Garricky's original rendition of the unicorn showed that the man would have been a better cartoonist than a paleontologist. It wasn't until 1749 that the... I mean, this is long before the term paleontology was even coined, to be fair. The word paleontology didn't really exist. I don't think it even existed until like 1823 or something like that. Um, wasn't it uh, Blanville, French naturalist, who coined the term paleontology? I think it was the same person for whom Blanville's beaked whale is named after. Unicorn yeah. further looked into in the book Protegea, which was posthumously released by mathematician and scientist Gottfried Leibniz. Leibniz mm. was known for his development of the main ideas of none other than integral and differential calculus. Along with Isaac he Newton, He also yeah. refined the binary number system, was an esteemed philosopher, and wrote in several different you languages. do all kinds of stuff back many, then. Many other things. Leibniz believed in a place among natural curiosities. 1817. Oh, interesting, Dr. Dave. Okay, he okay. Like to say. Yeah. He believed in the existence of things like talking dogs, genies, and, of course, unicorns. <laughs> but you're not going crazy, Chet. The, that noise there in the background is... um. That's interference, I guess, as this guy was recording this. Maybe he had a wireless mic or something. Existence of things like talking dogs, genies. There you go. You hear it? Unicorns. Mm. On the topic of the Magdeburg unicorn, he wrote the following and included his own drawing of the actual fossil on display. Quote, Since it has been demonstrated that unicorns, once... One of the most curious and rarest ornaments of natural history cabinets, but now surrendered by the people's admiration, come from fish from the northern ocean. We are allowed to think that the unicorn fossil found in our countryside has the same origin. This skeleton was broken and extracted by pieces because of the ignorance and carelessness of the diggers. But in the horn, mm. united with the head and some ribs, as well as the backbone and some bones, we're brought to this place. So, Leibniz disses the miners and is absolutely insistent that the unicorn was real. But what if it actually was... Wait. Leibniz said that? Oh, this is real. lost me. Anyway, this whole thing this is... This creature looks like it would live a life in pain. It looked more like a walrus. Anyway, so th that's a rhinoceros skull right there. That's the whole reason that we're talking about this is that this is a rhinoceros skull. And is this actually a good approximation of what this reconstruction was like at that time? And where does this come from? Is that a narwhal horn? Like, what is this supposed to be? I don't... Even this itself is inaccurate. Like, what is that? I... I don't know. With the narwhal horn glued to its nose, if anything. Narwhal but horn. Garrick okay. And, Leibniz were and that's not its nose. That's its forehead. But that this whatever. This was the majestic and graceful mythological creature. Anyway, I'll give you a link to this video right here. Um, it's weird. Can we find a um? Welcome. Oh nope. find a, a proper like primary source on this uh, complicated history of the Magdeburg unicorn usually Snopes is pretty good with this kind of thing uh, uh, 200,000 likes on Twitter the unicorn was in part a willow rhinoceros, a now extinct species that once roamed much of northern Eurasia until the end of the last ice age. The woolly rhino was described for the first time in 1769. Dur -dur um, what came first, the drawings or the model? 
Anyway, there's the actual animal right there, the woolly rhinoceros. Yeah. Anyway, here is a link to the Snopes page if you want to take a look at that. But we need to get into our actual fossil history of rhinoceros a little bit. And so why don't we go ahead and do that right now. And that'll give me a chance to go run to the little paleontologist room also. So without further ado, let's take a look at an old episode of my favorite television show when I was a kid. Paleo World. Yeah. It's one of the oldest creatures on Earth. No, it's not. No, it's not. What? Rhinoceros are pretty recent, actually. They only date back to, like, the Middle Cenozoic. They're not one of the oldest creatures on Earth. What? What? Old. It's called a living fossil. No, it's not called a living... Who calls rhinoceros a living fossil? Oh, boy. Soon, it may be only a fossil. Oh, don't Yet say one that. One of the world's most endangered animals is... One of the world's most endangered... I mean, there's five living species of rhinoceros. Some more endangered than others. Also, evolution's greatest success story. I'm sorry, how can you say that? Today they exist on exactly two continents. Africa and Asia. I wouldn't call that one of evolution's greatest success stories. I mean, shoot, they haven't even been around for that long since the mid-Cenozoic. Who wrote this? A story that begins far from Africa. In the yeah. Of the dinosaurs. I mean, it, after the dinosaurs. I was hoping to be able to just go to the bathroom right now. But instead, I gotta correct this. This is not going well, Dinosaur Dave. No. Uh. Hey, at least the theme music is soaring and uplifting and wonderful. Uh. Words don't have to be meaningful. There you go, Mayor Space. Yeah. <laughs> uh... Beneath the flatlands of Nebraska lies. There we go, Nebraska farmer. Are you still here? We're getting into the great state of Nebraska here. It's a layer of volcanic ash covering. A I'm gonna go around to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Yet there are no volcanoes in Nebraska. The ash came from Idaho. A thousand miles away, ten million years ago. Lava was spewed for miles around, but worse than the blast was the fallout. A deadly cloud of ash floated over the land, then it began to fall. In some places, several inches accumulated. In others, ten feet. All life was suddenly frozen in a time capsule of gray ash. Ten million years later, the time capsule was opened. In 1978, Mike Voorhees of Nebraska University was prospecting for fossils in the ash beds of Verdigree Creek in eastern Nebraska. At the end of a fruitless day of searching, he looked up from the bottom of the creek bed and saw something on the bank. Against the gray ash, it gleamed white, like bone. I came across a ravine that led to a volcanic ash bed perched high up on the wall. And I crawled up and saw, to my surprise, a lower jaw of a baby rhinoceros sticking out of the bottom yep. of this volcanic ash bed. Very cool. I could see cool. the tips of the upper teeth and figured that there was probably an entire skull there. There was, and not only a skull, but Beautiful. an entire skeleton. Holy cow. Mike would soon learn that it was the find 
of a lifetime. Yeah. Ecstatic, he dug deeper into the ash and found hundreds of rhinos. Yep. After three decades of digging at Ashfall, his crew has uncovered a whole menagerie of ancient creatures. Not just rhinos, but horses, tortoises, carnivorans. Ten million years ago, which got filled with volcanic ash from a distant volcano and snuffed out the lives of, of hundreds of animals, including the rhinoceroses that we see in front of us here. Pretty Each cool. Each of these skeletons tells a story. Eruption was in Idaho, Kleber. Death on the North American savanna. One of the strangest creatures uncovered at Ashfall turned out to be the last of its kind. An entire race of rhinos that once lived in North America. It's not like they went extinct because of this, so get that idea out of your head. They did not go extinct because of this event. This was a fairly localized thing. Their their range probably was across northern the the Great Plains of North America. Um, yeah, and race race or species. Yeah, they what they mean is species there. It's kind of an antiquated term. But yeah. Ashfall was later nicknamed Rhino Pompeii, after yep. the ancient Roman city whose inhabitants were also wiped out by a volcano. Like them, these creatures lay preserved under a death mask of ash. Over time, rivers and rainfall have carved out hills and valleys here, yet the layer of ash extends evenly through the landscape. Mike Voorhees concluded that 10 million years ago, the land was flat and open. Yep. Pretty cool. Yeah. And yeah, it's the same Across hot spot Savannah, that forms the Yellowstone caldera, Kleber. Yep. Unlike their modern counterparts. And Dex Phantom says, can you explain the extent of the Great Plains for those who aren't from America? Yeah, you bet. Let's talk about the Great Plains real quick. Let's get a more upbeat song here, shall we? There we go. So, the United States. This is the Great Plains, basically. It goes also up into southern Canada, Alberta, and Saskatchewan. The Great Plains, right there. So that's Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, New Mexico, Texas, Oklahoma, uh, Kansas, Nebraska, South, and then North Dakota are all within the Great Plains. Yeah. Um, and is that the Missouri River right there that forms the, the eastern border? No, yes. Anyway, green right there is the Great Plains. There you go. And I would actually disagree with certain parts of this. I don't think I live in the Northwest. That includes the San Francisco Bay Area there. I don't. I do not consider this the Northwest. This is the West Coast, but whatever. Anyway, you'll always have disagreements about subjective things like this. But yeah, yeah. Anyway, forget this. Don't worry about it, reanimated bit. The Great Plains is here. The Great Plains. Yeah. Basically, from the Rocky Mountains east until you get to the is that the that's not the Missouri River, is it? I don't know. Anyway, yeah. Let's get back to the rhinoceros. Rhinos wandered in herds and congregated around water holes. For her, <laughs> there you go, freelancer. <laughs> After the volcano erupted, a huge cloud... Wombat Hole says, America is big. Some of it not urbanized. Some of it. Some... <laughs> no, it's... America's like... It's, it's like Australia, you know? The vast majority of it is not urbanized. 
Um, the vast majority. Um, there are certain parts, shoot, where I used to live and work in Montana, especially eastern Montana, you can you can drive for like 300 miles, you know, without seeing another human being in certain areas. Um, it's crazy. Yeah. The best parts of it are not urbanized. Well, sometimes. The, the, the parts that have dinosaur fossils. Oh, yeah, those are the best parts. But I'm a big fan, you know, of, uh, of our urban areas, too, of course. Being a resident of the beautiful, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. Um, you know, I'm equally at home sleeping in a tent every night for a month out in the middle of nowhere or in the middle of a bustling city. You know? It's all good. I love it all. Urban areas have museums. This is true, Mia Miyakoto. Yes, indeed. In many cases, yes. Made up of Lots of rural museums, too, also. Of ash covered the land. Each tiny speck was deadly. Its oh, boy, that ash. Its like a knife and just as sharp. Yeah, when the up. animals around the waterhole inhaled the ash, it lacerated their lungs. Think of the, the ash, that volcanic ash. Don't think of it like ash from a fireplace. Think of this as tiny pieces of volcanic glass. Think about if you ground up glass into dust and then you breathed it into your lungs. Think about how that would slice up all those soft pink bits inside your chest. That's that's nightmarish to think about, you know? Slowly, they were cut to pieces from inside, then uh. covered up. As uh. Ashfall was excavated, the details of the disaster emerged. Then, so did another tragedy. This is an especially touching association because we have a, a very young baby rhinoceros that had barely started eating solid food. It was probably less than a month old when it died. Oh. Uh, next to it is this adult female, almost certainly its mother. We know it's a female because it has a small tooth or tusk at the front of the lower jaw. Huh. And adult females like this... No other creature in the world looks like a half-plucked turkey. And walks like a pot-bellied bear. Undisclosed space frog. 19 months of support. Thank you, space frog. I appreciate you. Thank you for keeping me online for that long. That's almost a whole year, isn't it? Thank you, space frog. I'm almost... You're almost ready to start eating solid foods, aren't you? Tooth or tusk at the front of the lower jaw. Thank you. And adult females like this either have a baby inside them or next to them. So it's... Uh, it's really quite a tragedy. Thank you, Space Frog. I appreciate you. Uh, uh, literally hundreds of, of these animals uh, dying a pretty agonizing death from lung failure caused by a volcano a thousand miles away. Yeah. Yet uh, the rhino turned out to be a survivor. I don't know if fish scales volcanoes, preserve melanosomes. I'm not sure, Gimp Leg. I don't ages. know. Ages. Rhinos have taken everything nature threw at them and come back for more. Yeah. Most species die out within 10 million years, not the rhino. Whoa. Hang on. There's multiple species of rhino alive today. This is the same the kind of thing we were looking at yesterday where people are confusing species with, like, clade. You know, a clade is like a branch. You can have a bunch of different species on it. Um... So yeah, they're getting they're getting that part wrong. Uh, Moo Hoodles, how are you doing? Welcome, Moo. Happy International Rhino Day to you. Welcome back to Paleontologizing. Yeah. And how much do those chonky boys eat in one day? Uh, a lot. Grilled Pikachu. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how many grilled Pikachus they could consume in a day. How big is a Pikachu? I don't. I don't know. Probably less than a meter long, I'd imagine. It's an evolutionary success story 50 million years old. Oh, and here we go. Little quiz here. What kind of rhinoceros? What species is this right here? This is a, I'll give you two options. Is this a black rhino or a white rhino? Remember, the color doesn't matter. They're both gray. 
White rhino, black rhino. Forget the colors. They're both gray. White or black rhino? Hmm. And why? Ooh, look at that snout. Yeah. There you go, Lenina. Yes. Wide for white rhino. Black rhinos have got that again. Um, yeah. That's a black rhino on the left, white rhino on the right. Think white is wide, wide rhino, wide mouth, long, like wide mouth for grazing. Black rhinos are browsers more. They've got that pointy mouth. Yeah, wide whips. There you go, Golganek, yeah. Yeah, black rhino, white rhino. Black rhino, white rhino. White, white rhino, wide mouth, wide rhino. Got it? Got it. Good stuff. 50 million years old. Yeah. The proof lies in North America. Here, much of that story unfolded. And here, the fossil record is most complete. I think we have to respect the rhinos. These animals have been with us on the earth for millions and millions of years. Yep. They've come in a huge variety. Not been with us on the earth. They predate us as humans by a long way. Holy cow, rhinos first evolved in what, like the Miocene or something like that? Or earlier? Ol Oligocene, I think? I don't think they go back to the Eocene. I think their Oligocene is when they first evolved. But, um, yeah. Yeah. Shapes and sizes. They've managed to live in environments from tropical jungles to the Arctic tundra. Uh, I think they're an evolutionary masterpiece. I agree. They really are. Look how cool they are. Um, Dex Phantom Hawk says, is North America the best place to find fossils? Yeah, that's a good question, Dex Phantom Hawk. I would say, in my opinion, as someone who has found many, many fossils over the years, the best place to find fossils is the place near where you are. There have been fossils found on all seven continents. Even dinosaur fossils have been found on all seven of Earth's continents, including Antarctica. I'm actually working on a project to figure out which country has yielded the most dinosaur fossils, or at least the most dinosaur species that have been named, published on in the scientific literature. But, uh... The best place to find fossils is the place near where you are. Shoot, just yesterday. I was, uh, I took a little trip with some other paleontologists to go visit an area in the San Francisco Bay Area. Um, Yeah, there we go. At one of these sites. This is a lovely map that I actually have on my wall right over there in my office. 50 fabulous Bay Area fossil finds. This is the San Francisco Bay Area. This is, of course, where I live in the gorgeous, sunny San Francisco Bay Area. And, uh, anyway. We've got all kinds of, especially Pleistocene fossils here in the Bay Area from the, uh, the last Ice Age. Um, and yeah, there's a, a particular place that I was visiting yesterday where there might be a new museum popping up at some point in the next decade or so. Very, very exciting. I was, oh man, very excited about this. There's talks going on right now about this, and um, 
I am thrilled to be involved. Anyway, even here in the beautiful sunny San Francisco Bay Area, there are fossils to be found. Even in this kind of paradise, you don't, you don't have to go out to the deserts of western Wyoming or eastern Montana or southern Alberta to find fossils. You don't have to go all the way out to the Gobi Desert of Mongolia. There are fossils to be found here. There are fossils to be found all over the world at different sites. So yeah. Lee G says Mars could have fossils. It could if Mars had life. Sure. The thing is, fossils are the re preserved remains of ancient life. I really hope Mars has fossils, but... So far, it doesn't seem like it does. I hope I'm wrong. I hope it turns out to have fossils. That would be awesome. But yeah. Yeah. Dex Phantom says, We will soon find out what fossils are in Greenland. Oh, don't say that. You're talking about because... As the climate continues to warm... We already have fossils from Greenland, though, Dex Phantom. We already do. We even have a dinosaur from Greenland. Platyosaurus. It's been found in Greenland. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, what is, what is this? Uh, what a threatening looking postcard. What is this unibrow right here? On this dingus. What is that? Oh no. Greetings from San, San Francisco Bay Area. <laughs> uh, freelancer, I appreciate you. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Call me Dex? I will call you Dex. Thanks. And Claire Burr says, I was just looking at cruising the fossil coastline. Claire Burr, you've got a keener eye than you realize. That's the same artist. This is Ray Troll. I I got this poster when I was visiting uh, that traveling exhibit at the Oakland Museum of California. In fact, I have that book packed. I'm going to be going on a trip this weekend. I have that book packed, and I'm going to be reading it a little bit as I travel along the West Coast by train this weekend so yeah yeah this is uh it's good stuff this is this is ray troll um yeah ray troll paleo artist yeah Um, here, take a look. Ray Troll. Here's his studio. He lives up in Alaska, also on the West Coast of these United States. This is what I call Troll Hinge. My name is Ray Troll. I'm an artist, and this is the town of Ketchikan. It's where I live. My good buddy Hall is filming. Oh, let's look out there. There's the town of Ketchikan. And uh, 13,000 people. 175 Small town. Last year. There's Gravina Island over there. And the sun is... Hey, let's see. Let's see his studio. He's got some fossils in his garden. Anyway. Yeah, this is that artist, Ray Troll. This studio kind of reminds me of my office a little bit. I could pull that out. There's some thalatosaurs there in the background. Very cool. It's a male ratfish. Ratfish. We were talking about these yesterday. Chimeras. Rule, right, Hall? That's right. Ratfish. Ratfish rule. Let's There's Xyphactinus right there. And we'll turn on a light over here. And so this is where I do my work. And right now, 
I'm working on a couple of drawings here. And the Latasaurs. So the most underappreciated of marine reptiles. Yeah. Put a black and Greg Carr is a private collector. He's working with the uh, organ. Look at this wicked snout. Yeah, what a cool snout there. Uh, so I did this first one, and then I was like, eh, and then I actually have Anyway, yeah. The pen and inks, and sometimes I do the pen and inks. And you'll see this. Nice. This one is in the Look at that drafting table. Very nice. This is in a sketchbook called Prehistorica. Cool. And then do... Oh, there's Ray Troll right there. Or, excuse me, there's... This is Ray Troll. That's Kirk Johnson right there. This is from, uh... Yeah. Pen and ink and, and color pencil and paint out here. But then I scan this and I take it into the house. And that's the house over there. And that's where I do digital color. These are my... This is my, kind of my stack of sketchbooks. And they go back... Yeah. Exhibits. And so here's... The van See that art style? That's super cool. Anyway, this is Ray Troll. I'll give you the give you the link to the video here. But uh Good stuff. Good stuff. Yeah. Um Oh, and that's Check this out from our own Claire Burr. Claire, this is this is cool. I like this. <laughs> yeah, that might be a Jep uh, Jeopardy. A millionaire question later. Anyway, shoot, let's get back to the rhinos. We gotta get through the rhinos so we can get to who wants to be a millionaire slash paleontologist. If the modern rhino is a masterpiece of evolution, where is the original design? Design. Oh boy. Using creationist language here. Lies buried in the distant past far back in the age of the dinosaurs wait what they're not going to try and link ceratopsians and perissodactyl mammals are they if they're removed america loses them forever and dex thank you for continuing that gift sub you got from mirth thank you very very much i really appreciate that thank you kindly welcome to the community Thank you for that pledge of ongoing support. That means so much to me. It really does. Thank you very, very much. Excellent. Here, let's let's continue. The African rhino has walked the earth for only three million years. Yet its heritage stretches back to creatures more ancient. Not Ceratopsian dinosaurs, don't say that. Six it's not a dinosaur. Years ago, oh, the boy. world was coming to an end for the dinosaurs. Yeah, okay. One of the last was Triceratops. Yeah. A leader that grazed across the plains of North America. Yep. Even more of a browser, honestly, given its mouth shape, but okay. With three mighty horns and a crest as big as its head. It a frill, for frill, not crest, frill. T-Rex might hesitate to attack it. Its success uh, lay in its design. Design. It had a round oh body, so it was hard to attack. It had a cast iron stomach, so it could eat almost anything. That's super misleading. Uh, woe betide the non-English as a first language speaker who reads the closed captions for this. Like, oh, well, very interesting. It had a stomach made of iron. Most fascinating. No, it didn't. It, uh, its stomach was made of soft, squishy stuff, like everybody's stomach. Oh, boy. Uh, a cast iron skillet? Did someone put it in the dishwasher? No. <laughs> oh, no. I, I know sometimes I make facetious remarks and sometimes I'm misleading about things for comedic effect, but this is just egregious. It had short legs, so it's... 
they weren't they weren't short they were long enough to reach the ground you know especially its hind limbs were actually pretty long center of gravity was low and it had eyes set high on its head so it could graze and keep watch at the same time triceratops was the rhino that's actually pretty cool like that's actually a really neat effect that this is really inventive where like if you've got a low budget and you can't afford cgi or anything like that you take a plastic triceratops you stick it next to a little pond and you make the pond ripple a little bit and then you film it and zoom in like that's actually a really neat effect that's pretty Triceratops cool. Triceratops was the rhino's prototype. But no, it wasn't. Oh, boy. No. It wasn't. It's an entirely different kind of animal. It's not like a rhinoceros. At all, really. I mean... Uh... That's very misleading. But a whole line of knockoffs would follow before the first true rhino emerged. 30 million years ago, after extinction killed off Triceratops, the first proto-rhino appeared in Egypt. No, I mean, shoot, there were there were Uintotheres and Brontotheres long before that, right? In the Eocene? I don't know what they're talking about here. Arsinoetherium preserved traits from Triceratops. To no, it didn't. They're not from Triceratops. Like... Maybe to some people it looks are superficially similar, but that's not the same thing as that they're being the same traits. It's not. Uh... These are not phylogenetically close to each other at all. They're not related. That's very misleading. It's very misleading. Mighty horns and four stout legs. Yeah. Narwhals are the same as deer. Well, they are both ungulates there. Narwhals and deer? are much closer to each other than these animals are to Triceratops. I want to get that point across. So, um... A narwhal is much closer to a deer than this animal is to a Triceratops. Much, 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 much closer. Like, narwhals and deer are both ungulates. They're both hoofed mammals. They're both part of Ungulata. In fact, they're both artiodactyls. They both belong to the same group of hoofed mammals. Narwhals and deer much, much closer to each other than this animal is to a Triceratops. By, like, orders of magnitude. I, well, I don't know how to quantify it, but anyway. So much closer. So, so much closer. This animal, so much closer to a deer than this animal is to a Triceratops. I want to emphasize that point. And narwhals have hooves? I mean, they're ungulates. They are hoofed mammals. Granistuda, they are... Maybe you were... Maybe you just came in a little while ago, but we were talking about this earlier. Here. Let's go to the group that includes narwhals and deer. Cetariodactyla. Oh, boy. Um... Cloven hoofed ungulates. Satariodactyla. Here we go. Yeah. There we go. So this is the group that includes... Goats and pigs, dolphins and giraffes, llamas and bison and deer and hippopotamus. Narwhals are also part of this group. So watch. Cloven hoofed ungulates... Let's type in narwhal, and you'll see it'll zoom to a little branch on this. There you go, right there. Narwhal. They're super close to deer, actually, in the grand scheme of things. So narwhal to deer. Let's go to, say, musk deer. Right there. They are super close to each other. It's 
so contrast that with, um, say, a rhinoceros. Rhinocerata day right there. Let's go from, say, a white rhinoceros to where Triceratops would be. Which would be, um... Archosauria. Birds and crocodilians. You gotta zoom way outside, outside of mammals, and all the way over there to birds and crocodilians. We don't have extinct dinosaurs on here, so we can't zoom from Rhinoceros to Triceratops, because Triceratops isn't on this tree, because it's an extinct animal. But yeah, the point stands. This animal is so much closer to a deer than this animal is to a Triceratops. So that's why the narration here really bugs me. Really bugs me. Arsinoe Ethereum preserved traits from Triceratops. It did not. Uh, they're superficially similar, but they're not the same traits, you know? Uh, uh, uh. You know, it's like... It's like saying that a coffee maker is similar to a hamster because little brown things come out of both of them. It's like, what? Huh? I don't know. It's hard to come up with a good analogy for this kind of thing. But just take it from me. That's a wild assertion right there. Completely wrong. Arsinoe Ethereum preserved traits from Triceratops. It didn't. Two mighty horns. Not preserved. They're independently down. evolved. Not preserved. Independently evolved traits. Meanwhile, in North America, a similar creature evolved. The Brontothere, or Thunder Beast. Yep. At two and a half tons and nine feet tall, it was the biggest plant eater on the continent. But nature's attempt to build a rhino now suffered a setback. Oh, and we've got orthogenesis here, too. Uh, nature's attempt to build a rhino. Like, this is some goal that nature had. There's no goal in my... It's just things evolve based on what conditions are that change from year to year, from season to season. There's no, like, you know, puppet master trying and failing to create a rhinoceros here. It's not, that's not how it works. The climate grew cooler and drier, uh... and forest turned to grassland. Unable to live off the land, brontotheres disappeared. Even as they were dying out, their replacement was evolving. Hyrocaeus. It seemed a step backward. It was slender, not stout. Long a step back. Oh boy. Whatever. More -legged, orthogenous. Not short. And no bigger than a great dane. Yet, it was the first true member of the rhino. F and Claire, but you got a squirrel in the house. Well, well, well. How, how did that happen, Claire? Sorry. Deal with the squirrel. Don't, don't answer my queries right now. Best of luck with you, Claire Burr. Squirrels are crafty little critters. Little little nimble rodents. Best of luck to you, Claire. Family. Over millions of generations, it would spawn 200 species of rhinos. It's probably a red squirrel, because I think Claire lives up kind of near Sacramento. We don't really get gray squirrels in Northern California. It's almost certainly a red squirrel. Yeah, let's look up let's look up red squirrels on our tree of life, shall we? Let's jump from birds and crocodilians to red squirrel. There's probably multiple species of red squirrel. But there we go. Yeah, that looks about right. Are these the ones that exist? Northern California? No, it's not. Um, five types of squirrels that live in California from Bird Watching HQ. These aren't birds, but whatever. Um, Eastern Gray Squirrel. 
Probably not that. They don't live in California. What is this clickbait garbage title? They don't live in California. Oh, get lost. I don't want your cardinal quiz. Um, Fox Squirrel, that looks right. Nope, not right. They don't live in California either. This doesn't look right either. Western Gray Squirrel, nope. Douglas Squirrel, well, that's probably not it either. Flying Squirrel, that's definitely not it. That lot of good that article did. Not ideal. What types of squirrels are in California? Do I have to go to, to iNaturalist for this? Username for iNaturalist. Um, uh, anyway, I don't know what kind of squirrel it is, but Clairbur, I hope it's. Let's see. Berkeley squirrels. So, just down the road from me in the San Francisco Bay Area, in Berkeley, California, you see these squirrels. What is the genus and species of these squirrels? Because I bet you that's the same one that Claire Burr is dealing with right now. I realize we're not talking about rhinos right now. Squirrels are not rhinos. Don't get it twisted. Um... Is it a Douglas squirrel? Might be. They look a little. This might be the one where you live, Claire, because you live kind of up near like Rockland, California, right? Yeah. The Douglas are small and dark. Okay, cool, cool. It is a small western gray, but we have Douglas here. Okay, interesting. Okay. I'm glad you know that, Claire. Cool. Cool, cool, cool. And squirrels are related to rhinos, but they're a long way away. Again, let's... Let's jump to... Douglas Squirrel. Down here in Rodentia, which I believe is part of Borouteria. Or is that Uranta, Uconta Glyries? I forget. Anyway, Douglas the Squirrel. Which are a kind of... Oh boy, this is going to be a while. Squirrels, rodents... Borouteria. It is Borouteria. Anyway. Douglas the Squirrel. Let's jump from that to... Rhinoceros. We're way over here in Ungulata. Way over there. There you go. Rhinoceros. Yeah, so they are both mammals, but they're not closely related. Anyway. From let's the continue. Nature to the monstrous. Oh, Paraceratherium. Paraceratherium ruled Asia 30 million years ago. Holy cow. The largest mammal to ever walk the earth was a rhino. Bigger than an elephant. Bigger than any whale has ever gotten on land. On land. This Paraceratherium. 
Today, it dominates the research of Don Prothero from the Occidental College of Los Angeles. <laughs> uh, Don Prothero, holy, he was so young here. Holy cow. Don Prothero, he, he writes like two or three books every year, it seems like. Remarkably prolific writer. Holy cow. An expert on Cenozoic mammals. What's amazing of all the extinct rhinoceroses was a gigantic beast known as Paraceratherium. This animal lived in Asia from about 15 to about 35 million years ago, and it towered above the landscape, weighing in at about 20 tons and measuring yep. about 18 feet tall at the shoulder. It was so huge, it was about the size of many of the dinosaurs, and it had a lifestyle probably much like the giraffe, if you can think of our rhinoceros equivalent of a giraffe, living mm. off the leaves of the tops of trees. Pretty cool. Although a far cry from Hyrocyrus, Paraceratherium still preserved the blueprint. Within its huge legs, it retained the long yep, limbs three toes. and slender toes of its little ancestor. Yep. Paraceratherium was the largest mammal ever to walk the earth. And this is long before the first humans, MLF. Yeah, I think these go up to the Oligocene, or maybe Miocene, I forget. Somebody can look it up, Paraceratherium. Even the elephant was only one-fifth its size, and yep. only Paraceratherium ever grew as big as a dinosaur. Well, which dinosaur? We've got dinosaurs today that are only this big, you know, and they weigh less than a penny. Paraceratherium is as big as some of the... some of the sauropod dinosaurs. We were talking about yesterday. There we go. This is a lovely image right here. Yeah. So there's Paraceratherium. There's the biggest elephant that ever lived. Tradoon. Um, Paleoloxodon. And this is Patagotitan, one of the largest of the dinosaurs. Probably not the largest, but one of the largest. So, yeah. So, it's, you know. It's getting up there. You know? So, like, if if this is Arnold Schwarzenegger, this is Danny DeVito right here. You know? They could at least appear in some of the same movies. So, yeah. Yeah. And holy cow, Ko-Fi stream bot Bean has just supported the channel on Ko-Fi. What is this? Well, well, well. Holy cow. Dark Mock Rises. Thank you. For your support on Ko-Fi. I really appreciate that. Dark Mock. Thank you, thank you. That means a lot to me. It really does. So thank you. Ugh, good stuff. Excellent. Ramen time. There you go, Claire. Yeah, yeah. Anyway, Paraceratherium, it, it got big. It got, like, as tall as a giraffe. Not as tall as the tallest dinosaurs, though. Not nearly as massive, but... Yeah, but... It was cool. In fact, let me see if I can find you... A clip of... A relative... Here we go. It, they're going to call it Indricotherium in this, but it's the same animal. There we go. The largest rhinoceros that ever lived. The largest mammals to ever walk the earth. Yeah. Yep. Huh. 
15 tons. Dinosaurs reached, you know, 70, 80, maybe 90 tons. Not 19, 90. But 15 tons, you know, that's... You know, good for you, mammals. Good, 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 good for you. You know? A little, little pat on the head there. Very nice. Trying his best, okay? Says the birds are dead on, yeah. Uh, anyway, good stuff. That's that kind of animal right there that you see right here. Like the dinosaurs, it too disappeared. But the rhino design lived on. Yeah, okay. 22 million years ago, the world went through another change in climate. In North America, dense forests shriveled up, giving way mm. to open country. The American savanna. Yeah. To stomach the prairie, the vegetation, as we call it here. Many creatures died out, yet one thrived. Monoceros had teeth like grindstones and a cast hmm. iron stomach. Don't say that. Its stomach was not made of iron. It's very misleading to anybody who, for whom English is not a first language and, you know, cast iron stomach is like a, a figure of speech. But don't, don't say that in a science documentary. It also sported a pair of horns, just like Brontothere. Like its predecessor, Monoceros was eventually tested by nature. Around 19 million years ago, North America's warming trend heated up. Mm. The land was parched by an endless summer. Across the continent, thirsty creatures migrated in one direction, toward water. As more mm. animals gathered, the herds grew larger. And the the road show, yeah. Grew it's the writer, not the narrator, but yeah. When the last drops dried up, the forebears of the rhino fell dead, alongside primitive relatives of the horse and the pig. Yeah, that's not actually an ancestor of the pig, but whatever. One such graveyard was discovered in western Nebraska. Agate Springs is the largest yeah. find of monoceros bones in the world. Paleontologists estimate that 16,000 of these little rhinos died here, within just a few acres. How so many bones came to lie in one place was once a mystery, until it was solved by a paleontologist from Nebraska University's well, you're Museum, good retro, yeah. Bob Hunt. The most important clue in helping tell us something about how the rhinoceros came into the waterhole setting is that the teeth can be grouped in discrete age classes. Hmm. We have jaws that have teeth yeah, mammal representing teeth. babies, uh, middle-aged mammals, and old you adults. You can tell a lot from a mammal's tooth. The only tooth. way that you could find discrete age classes in a mass of rhinoceros bones like this is if the rhinoceroses were all birthed at about the same time. So <laughs> I feel like Forrest Gump. Now, Mama always said you could tell a lot about a mammal based on their teeth. Um... <laughs> Uh, mammals are mostly teeth, you know, it's, it's mostly what they are. Um, so we yeah, think if this was a herd that came into the water. What they're eating, what they're gonna eat. <laughs> Go retro, yeah. Um, how about the digestive system? That doesn't usually fossilize as well as the teeth do, Thandestruck, yeah. And thank you, Anonymous Gifter, for gifting Jack's Facts right there. Once up to Jack's Facts. I really appreciate that. Jack's Facts, are you here right now? Welcome, welcome, and happy World Rhino Day to you. And died in a yeah. uh, very shallow body of water over uh, a period of just weeks to months. The herd resurfaced, 
on a cattle ranch. A cowboy found what looked like the petrified bones of Indian ponies. Huh. Instead, they were monoceros. Yeah. With this bonanza of fossils, Bob Hunt has learned not only why monoceros died, but how it lived and what it looked like. Hmm. These were very long-legged rhinoceroses, uh, perhaps a ah. little more long-legged proportionally than the modern rhinos that the average... Wow, their legs went... The legs went all the way to the ground. Look, they got legs. They got legs in all the right places. You know? Long-legged rhinoceroses, <laughs> uh, perhaps a little more long-legged proportionally than the modern rhinos that the average yeah. person is used to seeing. These rhinos legs for days. Birds, for four days, because they got four legs. Yeah. For several million years, Monoceros was the sole... In India, yes, MLF, yeah. <laughs> then, 18 million years ago, it vanished, just like its predecessors. Poof, it's gone. A million years later, a new proto-rhino arrived from Asia. This one with shorter legs that still somehow go all the way to the ground. Teleoceros. With its barrel-shaped body and stomach... And yes, fossil dung can give us a lot of clues about digestion and diet, Kennedy. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. On the path of evolution, Teleoceros would be left by the wayside. Yeah. No, I mean... But that... Eventually that happens to all of us. We all get left on the wayside on the path of evolution. You know? That fate comes to claim us on all. the path of evolution... Teleoceros would be left by the wayside. <laughs> Join the club. You know, that's every organism that's ever lived. But yeah. Corgi rhinos. Yeah, they got real short legs. America ends in eastern Nebraska. Here lie hundreds of victims of a volcanic eruption in the mass graveyard called Rhino Pompeii. Uncovered by Mike Borges anybody call in it that, though? 1978, it's one of the rarest fossil sites in the world. I, had... I mean, aren't all fossil sites rare because there's only one of each of them? That's like saying the Golden Gate Bridge is the rarest bridge in the world. Because there's only one of it. The Bay Bridge, just over, just over there, J just over there, is also the rarest bridge in the world because there's only one of it. You know? You're like, what? <laughs> oh, the writing in this no episode. At the time, that this would be the first of more than 200 skeletons that lay buried at the bottom of this ash bed. Mayor Space says, I'm the rarest human in the world, because there's only one of you, Mayor Space. There you go. There's only one, the Mayor of Space, separated by underscores. I wish I had remembered those underscores when I was trying to get you that perpetual gift sub, Mayor of Space. I still need to talk to Twitch staff about that and get that for you. Um, yeah, because I haven't been cooked at all. <laughs> That's... Not even medium rare. You're still just rare, 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 mayor space. Good stuff. Teleoceros looked uh, more like a hippo than a rhino and acted like one, too. Mm. It lolled around water holes, sharing them with other beasts that seem more at home in Africa. To a paleontologist, this is an amazingly interesting place to work. We have essentially a snapshot of yeah. a moment in time 10 million years ago. It's a truly beautiful really sight. Things like the fact that rhinos and, and uh, camels and three-toed horses Derp, live here that probably most Americans have, have no idea once inhabited our, our landscape. We're Gosh darn it. the surface here. Uh... Hang on. I was trying to pull up my visit to this site back in 2022. And cross your fingers this doesn't crash the stream. Opening up a portable hard drive right now. Oh, darn it. Is this the wrong one? It is the wrong one. Anyway, shoot. Um, That's okay. 
The yeah. skeletons that we see before us in this I visited are here. less than 1% of the uh, of the total fossil deposit. Which actually we might be able to find we might be able to find this because there was one of those like bot channels on YouTube. Gotta love YouTube. It's full of bots and trolls and all kinds of assorted nonsense. Um Let's see if I can find this, because I don't know if it was India or Indonesia or, like, somebody from one of these countries had, like, a bot thing where they... You know, one of these bot channels. Hmm. Alright. Scoot, scoot, scoot. There's a bunch of stuff with me, and then... There we go. Yeah. So... This is a bot channel right here. Stealing my content. Yeah. Isn't that wonderful? Isn't YouTube a grand and beautiful platform? Nothing shady would ever go on there. This is one of our live streams from the field this past summer. Yeah. Some good old-fashioned stolen content. Gotta love YouTube. Anyway. Yeah. Um, there's another one from the same channel. I've tried reporting these, and YouTube doesn't do anything about them. Which is great. Gotta love that. Yeah. Um, anyway, let's see if we can find the one that they pirated from Nebraska. Because I didn't even actually uh, post that one to YouTube, but they snagged it somehow off of Twitch directly. Hmm. Yeah. And send a DMCA takedown? I already did. Gamers Tavern Show? Yeah. Um, like, they're just inundated with these. There's so many bots on YouTube that I think they're backlogged with this kind of thing. Anyway, these are all me, because you can tell because of the tan. There we go. But yeah. Me too, right? Yeah, good. And then the, now we're getting to stuff that's not me. Oh, hang on. Wait, wait, wait. What is this? Hang on a minute. Ray Bradbury Theater? What's this about? This seems super cool. We might have to watch this another time. Is that Ray Bradbury himself? Famed dinosaur author. People ask, where do you get your ideas? Right here. That's him. Tell by his voice. Martian landscape. Somewhere in this room is an African belt. Just beyond, perhaps, is a small Illinois town where I grew up. And I'm surrounded on every side by my magician's toy shop. There's the man himself. I'll never starve here. I just look around, find what I need, and begin. I'm Ray Bradbury. Huh. And this is... The Ray Bradbury Theater. Well, then, right now, 
What shall it be? Out of all this, what do I choose to <laughs> I never know where the next one will take me. Hmm. Exactly one half exhilaration, exactly one half terror. Oh boy, we're gonna have to watch this another time. Shoot, I'm gonna snag this. Let's grab that link right there. This is good stuff. What a fortuitous little uh little moment there. Yeah, holy cow. Put this in my notes. Oh, yeah, good stuff. Anyway, so I'm rhinoceros. Finding out what is around the next bend of the waterhole. I visited this site back in 2022. What lay around Some of you were here for that broadcast. In the long odyssey of the American rhino. Yeah. A new journey would begin and lead the rhino back to Africa. Hmm. For almost 50 million years, the ancient rhino thrived in North America. Then, five million years ago, it suddenly disappeared. Hmm. Mike Voorhees, who found the fossil graveyard of Rhino Pompeii, hunted for the answer. Rhino Pompeii, a.k.a. Ashfall Fossil Beds State Park in Nebraska. Away at a gravel pit called Big Springs. With his wife, Jane, Voorhees sought traces of rhinos. And <laughs> They found nothing, and that was the answer. Five million years ago, glacial rivers began to deposit gravel like this all across the Great Plains. Hmm. We know that the climate had changed. When we search these beds for fossils, we find no remains of rhinos or other critters that would have required a tropical climate. We therefore think that the Great Ice Age dealt the death blow to all North American rhinos. Interesting. Yet, once again, nature wasn't through with the rhino. The beast died, but the design survived. Oh my goodness, that's confusing. Uh, are you trying to confuse people with that writing? The beast died, but the design survived. What? What does that mean? Are you implying convergent evolution? Because it's not convergent evolution. There's, like, a, a different branch of rhinoceros that survive in, in Africa. A hundred thousand years ago. And Asia. During the last ice age, a new rhino appeared. Europe, too. The in woolly Asia, rhino. On the cold steppes of Siberia. Yeah. And that's Elasmatherium, which I don't know if it actually is a rhino. Elasmatherium, I think, might be a different group of mammal. Elasmatherium. As uh, big as an elephant. It had a skull almost four feet long. Is is Elasmatherium actually a rhino? Um, Elasmatherium. Oh, goodness. Look, Google puts a picture of a unicorn right here. It's really annoying. Anyway, Elasmatherium. And this is the distinctive group of rhinoceroses separate from the group that contains living rhinos. Okay, so it is a rhinoceros, Elasmatherium. Fair enough. Um, there was a clip with, uh... With none other than Stephen Colbert. Oh, shoot. Am I going to be able to find this? I don't know. Maybe not. Gosh darn it. Yeah, YouTube search also used to be better. Um... Is 
it here? Maybe not. Maybe I'll do a Google search and see if I can find it. Um. No, I'm not going to be able to find it. Shoot. Unless... Hang tight, everybody. I'm trying to find this here. Um... Nope. No dice. This used to be a thing that I could readily find through YouTube search, but... Like, everything gets worse over time. And, uh, that's just not working right now. So nuts to that. Anyway. And a horn more than six feet long. Oh! When the but! You know what? We've got something even cooler to look at for Elasmatherium. This is a critter that you might remember if you're a fan of the Star Wars. Well, well, well. This creature, Elasmatherium, its ancient rhinoceros relative, was actually featured in the Star Wars series, The Mandalorian. Check it out. Uh. It's not a, an exact one to one depiction, but you get the idea. Yeah. Yeah, get him, Elasmatherium. Defend your home. Anyway. Yeah. Um. Anyway. Danny is clearly a Trank fan. I don't know what that is. Dark Monk Rises. What's Trank? Yeah. Anyway. You know what I am? I'm a paleontologist. That's what I am. I'm not a fan of anything. I do my own stuff. <laughs> uh, uh. Anyway, Elasmatherium. Take a look. Ice Age ended 10,000 years ago, it melted away. Now, the rhino is making its last stand. As a paleontologist, I can witness in the rocks the great success that rhinos have had on, on the planet Earth. Yeah. Uh, it disturbs me deeply that we may be the last generation to see rhinos alive. My wife and I saw a single female rhino in Amboseli Park in Kenya a couple of years ago. It just broke my heart to, uh, to think that, uh, that these great creatures uh, could perish from the earth. And uh, we can do something about it. Yeah. We can do something about that. And there are passionate conservationists and scientists trying to do that right now. There is some interesting news that just came out. 
yesterday. Colossal Biosciences. This is the group with George Church et al. And Biorescue partnering up to save northern white rhino from extinction. Northern white rhinos are functionally extinct. Colossal and Biorescue plan to change that. Well, well, well. Let's see if, if we can find a source other than sci-fi.com. Um... Here we go. With only two living females left, the partnership will contribute to the genetic recovery of the northern white rhino from complete extinction. Colossal developed a pioneering toolkit for the challenging task to restore genetic diversity from museum specimens for a living population of critically endangered species. And there we go. Here's the full press release here. Yeah... video to watch that would be ideal there we go hmm. let's try upload date no results found? What's wrong? Seriously, YouTube is really frustrating sometimes. Sometimes it's just straight up broken. Like, the search just does... It refuses to work. Um... Garbage. Basura. Afuera. Be gone with you. That's lousy. The more things get improved, the worse they get, it seems, with tech. It's really frustrating sometimes. But you know what's not frustrating? Tila Aurora! Thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. Are about to get flattened by dinosaur content. Welcome to Paleontologizing. How are you doing? It's good to have you here, Tila. Thanks for joining us. What's shaking? How did your stream go? Tell me about it, first of all. Tell me how your stream went. I want to hear all about it. And welcome to Paleontologizing. We are celebrating right now World Rhino Day. Talking about these incredible animals, rhino serratids, rhinoceros, their fossil history, their ancient past, their present, their conservation, and their hopeful future. Did I know that birds are dinosaurs? Of course I did, Tila Roar. That's why I made those emotes. Welcome, Tila. <laughs> Yeah! And you were doing something called Seven Days to Die. It sounds a little... A little dire, but I'm glad you're here. We bonked zombies on their heads. Very nice. Well, I hope it was swift and painless for the zombies. Do zombies feel pain? I don't know. Do mythical creatures feel pain? I'm not sure. But anyway, it's good to have you here. Yeah. Um. Anyway. We're talking about rhinoceros. And, uh. That's all good. Happy World Rhino Day 2023. Painful for Tila, for sure. Well, I'm glad she's here, safe and sound. Quack sad, squack sage. 
Welcome to Paleontologizer. Yeah. Um, good to have you here. We're talking about rhinoceros today. We're about to wrap that up, actually. Um. Yeah, here. Dare we delve into the cesspool that has become Twitter? Yes, that's my number. What? Um. World Rhino Day. Yeah. Rhino Day 2023. Trying to find stuff that's not made by AI or bots or anything like that. It's tricky. Somebody who isn't trying to sell me some sort of cryptocurrency scam or whatever. Um, let's try this. To celebrate World Rhino Day, here are our top five fun things we love about rhinoceros. Well, well, well. We're going to supply our own music. They make their own kind of magic across the African savanna. Okay. They like to socialize. I mean, some of them do. White rhinos in particular live in social groups. Yeah. Black rhinos are a bit more solitary. Black and white rhinos are back, both in fact gray. Yes, we talked about this earlier. Yeah. We talked about the difference between white and black rhinos who are both gray. Yeah. This is mostly clickbait here. Baby rhinos are the cutest. We all know this. They're very cute. Holy cow. Very, very cute. Yeah. They live in the sunshine. This is true. Wombat all. Happy World Rhino Day, everybody. There you go. Good stuff. Good stuff. Maybe next World Rhino Day we'll have a, a fossil rhino expert to uh, to interview here on stream. We'll see. I've been very busy. I haven't had time to organize that kind of thing before uh, before today's broadcast. But that's all right. You know what we do have to get to, everyone. Shoot. We do have to get to... Who wants to be a millionaire? Or rather, who wants to be a paleontologist? So let's go ahead and get to that. Shall we? I think we shall. This is our weekly review game. And I think you're going to like it a lot. If you've never been here for this before, you're in for a treat. Who wants to be a paleontologist? Starting right now.
Well. Welcome, welcome. To Who Wants to Be a Paleontologist? This is our semi-weekly review game. In which I quiz you, the viewers, on what you've learned on these broadcasts over the past... Oh, shoot, is it three weeks at this point? Holy cow. It's been a while. And give you a chance to win one million imaginary dollars. Think of all of the imaginary things you could buy with a million imaginary dollars. Holy cow. Well... Without further ado, why don't we go ahead and get into it? I'll explain how this works. You will see a question that will appear here on the screen. You'll be given four different options for your answer. A, B, C, or D. You will type the letter of the corresponding answer, A, B, C, or D, into chat. And I will kind of vaguely take chat's temperature to see what answer everyone wants. Each correct answer will advance you further toward the million dollars. Each incorrect answer will stop you dead in your tracks and the game will be over. So try not to answer incorrectly if you can help it. The better attention you have paid over the past two or three weeks, however long it's been the better shot you've got at uh, at getting this right. Or maybe you know these things on your own, in which case, hats off to you for, uh, for knowing a thing or two about fossil science. Anyway. Without further ado, let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? Question number one for $2,000. Here we go. We were just talking about this yesterday, I believe. The Jurassic Park logo's Tyrannosaurus skull is missing what? Is the answer A, it's eye socket. B, it's nostril. C, it's teeth. Or D, it's fourth finger. What do you think, chat? This is, an, this is an easy one. But, you know, it is the first question. I'm seeing a lot of bees in the chat here. Hmm. This is the only thing I will get right, says Neon Coffee Cat. Uh, we talked about this yesterday. We talked about this last Friday, I think. Or was it Monday? I don't remember. Anyway. The Jurassic Park logo's Tyrannosaurus skull is missing what? Hmm, here's an Allosaurus skull. Right here. Might be a hint. Well, anyway, it seems like chat is pretty well set on B. It's nostril. How could you be missing your nostril? got no nose. Helgrim says B. Helgrim, welcome to paleontologizing. Well, let's go ahead and select B, since that's what chat seems to want. And is this your final answer? Helgrim, thank you for the follow. Welcome, welcome. It's good to have you. Are you sure you want that? Jurassic Park, Tyrannosaurus skull. Hold on to your butts. Let's say yes here. And you are correct. Very nice. Yes, indeed. The Jurassic Park logo's Tyrannosaurus skull is missing its Neris, its bony nostril. Let me show you right here. There is the logo for Jurassic Park. There it is right there again. Take a look. No Neris. The nostril right here, like on our Allosaurus skull. 
the nose. It's gone. You know, my T-Rex, he has no nose. How does he smell? Terrible. No nose. Yeah. Anyway, talk about a stuffy nose. Yeah, it's gone. Non-existent. Anyway, you'll never look at the uh, Jurassic Park logo again the same way, will you? Nor the Jurassic World logo. You know, Jurassic World, they had every opportunity to actually get this right, and they didn't. They pooched it just the same. In fact, frankly, I'd say it's worse because, you know, it's... 20 years later. 22 years later. Oy. Anyway. Yeah, but you know what? You know who didn't get it wrong? Was you, chat. Very nicely done. $2,000 in your pocket right there. Congratulations. Let's move on to our second question, which is question number seven for some reason. And that reason is lack of time. Let's get into our second question. You ready? All right. Let's go for it. Derp. Hang on a minute. What? That wasn't supposed to happen. Jack, Jack, it's Marvin. Well, Jack's facts. Barry, you know that new sound you're looking for? Well, listen to this. Jack's facts. Well, welcome, welcome. It's paleontologizing here, Jack's facts. How are you doing? How is your stream? I hope it was really good here. Let me adjust my tie real quick. There we go. Quite spiffy. Welcome to Paleontologizing Jack's Facts. Hope you had a wonderful stream. And happy World Rhino Day to you. Were you also celebrating World Rhino Day, Jack's Facts? Now, you often talk about animals on your stream. We were talking about rhinos today. Maybe you had a better things to do. I don't know. But um, anyway, Jax Facts, thank you for the raid. Welcome to Paleontologizing. And welcome to Who Wants to Be a Paleontologist. Chat is, uh, is on their way to winning a million dollars, let's hope. Let's get into that. I didn't know it was, but we did talk a lot about rhino poaching and the problems with their conservation. Yeah, Jax Facts. Ugh. Not just poaching, but also conservation. We were talking about that earlier, too. Uh, habitat conservation. Habitat encroachment. Deforestation. Habitat loss. Ay. And traditional Chinese medicine, which is neither traditional, nor is it Chinese, nor is it medicine. Anyway. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Um, and I took courses on habitat conservation in South Africa in college. Very nice, Jax Facts. Very cool. And you, they've got, is it white rhinos or black rhinos that they have down there in South Africa? I forget. I know they're both gray. White rhino actually refers to the wide mouth of the rhino. We talked all about that too. Anyway, Jax Facts, it's good to have you here. Welcome, welcome. And thank you for doing what you do. Can we get one more shout out for Jax Facts? Go follow Jax Facts if you're not yet doing so. If you love rhinoceros as much as I do, you'll go follow Jax Facts. Yeah. Um, thank you, Lenina. Excellent. Anyway. Let's go ahead and get back into who wants to be a paleontologist for four thousand dollars we've got our next question here and it is as follows this 19th century scientist is widely held to be the 
And I, I would have put quotation marks around this if I could have, but unfortunately quotation marks break this program and cause all kinds of errors. So imagine there are quotation marks around this. Father of American paleontology. This 19th century scientist is widely held to be the father of American paleontology. Is the answer A, Richard Owen? B, Othniel Charles Marsh? C, Edward Drinker Cope? Or D, Joseph Lydie? What do you think, chat? We were talking about this a couple Fridays ago. Was it last Friday? Hmm. I'm seeing a C. I'm seeing some Ds. Uh, oh, and that's super cool, Jax Fax. Really neat stuff. I should go check out your, your VOD there. Excellent. Everybody, follow Jax Fax if you're not yet doing so. I mean that. Seriously, go follow Jax Fax. Cool stuff. And Lee G says, I remember it's D. The, the, some real confidence there from Lee G. Hmm. Yeah. Paleolord says D. Ooh, that might be an endorsement right there. D is for, I bought the book you recommended, says Golganak. Well, that's an endorsement also. Yeah. And Jack's Facts, yeah, you should totally do a similar show. DM me if you want to get links to the, what I use for this. Yeah. Dark Mock Rises says, I'll take my $2,000, Danny. Thanks. Here, let me let me get that for you. Here. Pull it out. There you go. Make sure you catch it. Oh, <laughs> my. And Jax Fax says, I'd say D, Cope and Marsh were contemporaries. Interesting, Jax Fax. Okay. Yeah. And we should do an interview at some point, Jax Fax. That would be nice. Yeah. Well, it seems like chat is pretty well decided. It's D, Joseph Lighty here, the father of American paleontology. Well, let's select that. Is this our final answer? What do you think, chat? I'm going to say yes in the interest of time. And of course, you are correct. Very nice. Joseph Lydy, the father of American paleontology. We talked all about him on his birthday. His 200th birthday. Was it last Friday or the Friday? It must have been last Friday. Good old Joseph Lydie. Yeah, September 9th, 1823, he was born. There we go. This is that book that uh, Golganaki purchased, right? The Last Man Who Knew Everything, Joseph Lydie. Um, Yeah, you can read more about him here on Wikipedia if you would like. We're running out of time, so here is a link. Go nuts, chat. Yeah. Anyway, good stuff. Yeah. Excellent. Well, well, well. Nicely done, chat. Let's go ahead and move on to our next question. You ready for it? I know you are. Let's do it for $8,000. Let's go. for 8,000 smackerinos. The question is, pill bugs belong to which group of animals? Oh, Jack's Facts, you might know this. Hmm. Is the answer A, insects? B, millipedes? C, crustaceans? Or D, pharmaceuticals? Hmm. Pill bugs. What do you think, chat? What do you think? Pill bugs, aka roly polies? AKA. Well, sow bugs are slightly different, but we're talking about these little critters. Little isopods. 
Isopods is actually like the proper name for this group of critters. They've got different regional terms for them, but this is what we're talking about here. These little guys. Which group of animals do they belong to? Woodlice. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. Are they insects? Are they millipedes? Are they crustaceans? Or are they pharmaceuticals? Hmm. You saw some today while moving firewood. Very cool, Bat Meddler. Yeah, they, they love to feed on rotting vegetation under wood piles and stuff like that. They make for good armor in the game Grounded, says Charkhan. Interesting. Never heard of it before, but welcome to Paleontologize. Yeah. I'm seeing a lot of C's and a B and another B and an A, but it's mostly C's so far. Chat seems to want C for crustacean. You think these are crustaceans? These animals? I mean, sure. If you say so, we can go ahead and do that. But is that your final answer, chat? Is that your final answer? I mean... Hold on to your butts. Of course you're correct. They are... Crustaceans. Pillbugs, a.k.a. Woodlice, a.k.a. Roly Polies, a.k.a. whatever you want to call them. They are terrestrial crustaceans. Let's find them on the old tree of life here. Pillbugs, there we are. They are isopods. To zoom into them on the grand tree of life. Backyard buddies is one by all. Yeah. Yeah. Isopods. Right there. There's a pill bug right there. Yeah. And they are. Zoom out further. We'll get to Crustacea. Shrimps and. Uh, Paracarids, Eumalacostracans, this other group that doesn't have a name, Malacostracans again. Oh boy, anyway, they're crustaceans. So, belong to the same group as shrimps, like you see here, and now this is not responding. Anyway, let's look up Pillbug on Wikipedia. Pillbug. Uh, Armadilla today. That's a, such a cool name. Yeah. They're a family of wood lice, a terrestrial crustacean. There you go. These guys, crustaceans. Pretty cool. Pretty cool. If you want to use a better word for them, you could do like Golganax says and just call them isopods. There you go. They are very cute little guys. Yeah. Anyway, you got that right. Eight thousand dollars in your pocket, chat. You ready to uh, double that to sixteen thousand? I think you are. Let's do it. Mm. For sixteen thousand dollars. The question is, which feathered dinosaur? is known to have had a red mohawk atop its head. Ooh, that's a tricky one. 16,000. We're not in Kansas anymore. This is going to be tricky. Not in Kansas. We've moved up into Nebraska or maybe Liaoning Province, China. Hmm. Which feathered dinosaur is known to have had a red mohawk atop its head? Is the answer A, Archaeopteryx, B, Guanlong, C, Dilong, or D, Anchiornis? What do you think, chat? Mm. Iconic Song says, I remember the video for this one. It's a tree climbing one. Ooh. Charlie's Dragon thinks it's D. Grilled Pikachu says B. Neon Coffee Cat says B. 
Bozo Centric says B. Guan Long. SV Harkin says B. Jax Fax says it's got to be D then. Truckhorn says D. Lenina says D. Muffzilla says D. Ooh. Hmm. Punk Rock. Yeah. Iconic Song and Farf say D. Paleo Lord says D. Golgan X says D is, I believe, the mustard. Wait, what? Oh, Plockman's mustard said D, too. Well, if chat wants the D, then we can do now, the dinosaurs. D. Charkhan, thank you for the follow. Welcome to Paleontologize. Yeah. D for melanosomes. I believe that starts with an M, but oh, we'll go with it anyway, Truckhorn. Well, well, well. D for Anchiornis. Is this your final answer, chat? Let's say yes. And you are correct. Very nice. Anchiornis is a dinosaur with a red mohawk atop its head. We can tell this from fossil melanosomes. It's pretty cool, actually. Yeah. Here we go. I think we watched this video earlier, didn't we? Five million years ago, the supercontinent Pangaea opened up, creating separate land masses. Yep. Peninsula. Murmur, murmur. Here we go. Like Anchiornis. Anchiornis. There we go. Yeah. Meaning near bird. This little dinosaur is completely covered in feathers. Yep. There's Guanlong, who is one of the decoy answers here. Three meters long and weighing 50 kilograms. Yeah, it's got a bony crest, but doesn't have a red mohawk, like Anchiornis, right there. Anyway, um, yeah, Anchiornis, small four-winged Paravian dinosaur. Look at that beautiful fossil there. Holy cow! Yeah, and it would be cool if Prehistoric Planet did the Jurassic period. That would be awesome. Anchiornis, not a big dinosaur. I mean, look at that. You might even say it's quite small. And... Yep. By studying the types of melanosomes, color cells, and comparing them with those of modern birds, scientists are able to map the specific colors and patterning present on this Anchiornis when it was alive. Yeah, Anchiornis is the first Mesozoic dinosaur for which almost the entire coloration was known. Yeah, and there is a life reconstruction based on that Beijing specimen. Look at that red mohawk. There you go. Good stuff. And uh, nicely done, chat. Nicely done. $16,000 in your pocket. Let's double that again, shall we? For 32,000, you ready for the next one? Let's do it. For $32,000. The question is, which jawless fish caused a major traffic hazard on an Oregon roadway? Is the answer A, hagfish, B, lamprey, C, a stracoderm, or D, a straspid? What do you think, chat? We may have just been talking about this yesterday when we were talking about the origins of uh, vertebrate life and our own lineage before it came out of the sea. We did just watch this yesterday, Smorphosaurus. Is it hagfish, lamprey, a stracoderm, or a strasbid? Which one of those jawless fishes is this? 
I'm seeing some B's from Sculpin. I'm seeing A, 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 A. Ha Agfish from Charlie's Dragon. A from Muffzilla. A from Paleo Lord. A is for awful lot of slime, says Golganek. Yeah. Jax Fax is, has to be Hagfish. Lamprey is also jawless, but Hagfish is farmed in large numbers and could cause a problem. Ooh. Some solid reasoning from Jax Fax there. Uh, well, if you're so sure, well, let's go ahead and select A for Hagfish. This is your final answer, chat. Jax Fax says, I came here to win, baby. <laughs> I didn't come here to make friends. I came here to win. Well, let's see if that happens. You are correct about that. The answer is hagfish. Yes, indeed. Here we go. From CNET, right here. Apocalyptic hagfish spill covers highway in slime. Containers filled with creepy sea creatures broke open on an Oregon highway, creating one of the slimiest roadway spills ever recorded. Can we find a video about this? I feel like that would be even more instructive. Here we go. Take a look at this. Crash unlike anything drivers or firefighters had ever seen. A semi filled with slime eels overturned on the slime orange. eels hagfish they're not eels at all the mess lingers behind the night team's mike benner is just back from depot bay and the scene of that crash and mike i can only imagine what it smelled like tell you what joe i've never seen anything like or what it, it tasted or like smelled anything like it for that i've matter. also never tasted it anything like a it truck full of slime eels destined for consumption in Korea topples over on a busy highway 101 will eat anything covering That's disgusting. just about everything in a thick layer of sticky slime it's really unbelievable one witness called it a tsunami I like how he's still here on site even though you can't see anything <laughs> he might as well be in front of a brick wall tsunami of slime uh, I wonder what nearly $200,000 oh. worth of hagfish or slime eel looks like well Wonder no more. Those You're poor animals at in a ditch along Highway 101. Uh, it smelled marine-like. It was uh, it was fishy. Senior Trooper Brian Tucker says around noon Thursday, a truck carrying 7,500 pounds of slime eels overturned south of Depot Bay. The crash sent the fish spilling out of its containers. In no time, the slime eels were covering the highway and several cars that had crashed as a result of the overturned trailer. It was a mess. They had. Mm. Uh, I mean, approximately 100. Poor hagfish. I agree, Lenina. Yeah. Roadway that was just completely and me too, Loganak. I feel sorry for them. And cars. Difficult to imagine if not for the pictures and videos from the scene. Just look at the mess. We managed to track down one driver who got caught up in it. I think we were just, you know, in awe and like shocked and like just. I mean, it was disgusting. But like, you had to, you had to look at it. Um, I mean, and the sound was disgusting, too. You know, they were, like, flapping all over the asphalt. And... Ugh. Ugh, gosh. Cleaning up was a chore. <laughs> Firefighters used upwards of 5,000 gallons of water to wash off the highway. Oh, okay. uh, boy. Anyway, don't... Moral of the story is, don't harvest and transport... Hagfish? But I get people really want to eat that slime, I guess. Oh boy, that's whatever. At the risk of editorializing overtly here, that's that's vile. Anyway, um, yeah, but you know what's not gross is you, chat. You got that question right. And good on ya. Hagfish are actually really important for, uh, for kind of understanding the origin of vertebrate animals like ourselves. Creatures that have got a backbone? Well, hagfish are 
descendants of the same ancestors that we evolved from. Hagfish and lamprey are both jawless fishes that uh, kind of give us some clues as to what our ancestors were like before they developed stuff like spinal columns. So pretty cool stuff. Cousin hagfish. There you go, Tila. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, you ready to continue? I think you are. Let's go for it for $64,000. Question number 11. Uh, the question is... Paleontologist Gary Vermeige has overcome which challenge in his career? Is the answer A, dyslexia? B, blindness, C, diabetes, or D, deafness. Ooh, what do you think, chat? I actually just went to go see one of Gary's talks uh, last week in Berkeley, California. I'm seeing some Bs in chat. Well, well, well. <laughs> Your space is not diabetes. <laughs> or is it? Is it? Hmm. Hmm. Well, it seems like Chad is pretty set on B right here. A paleontologist who's overcome blindness? Well, well, well. If you're so sure, chat, we'll go ahead and answer that right there. Is this your final answer? Hold on to your butts. Let's do it. And you are correct, of course. Gary Vermey, well-known blind scientist, paleontologist, evolutionary biologist, however you want to categorize him. Gary or Girat Verme, um, extraordinary person. Uh, let me find you a video here to kind of introduce him. Here we go. The pursuit of science is a lifelong passion in my case. To satisfy my curiosity, to find meaning in life, to find purpose in life. Good morning. Good morning. Fate intervened early in Herat Verme's life to yeah. provide his purpose in ways most unexpected Hirat. and challenging. Most people call him Gary, in as I understand it. Here, a small town in the province of Groningen in the Netherlands. This was right after the war. And um, very soon after my birth, it became clear that um, I couldn't see very well. And so I spent a good part of the first three years of my life in the hospital, uh. getting operation after operation. Herat was diagnosed with childhood glaucoma and lost his sight at age three. Had they not intervened, it would have meant swelling of the brain. That's the main reason the, er the surgeon elected to remove the eyes. Losing his sight caused Hirat to focus on his sense of touch. And yep. from that grew his fascination with the natural world. I don't remember a time when I wasn't curious about the outside <laughs> world. My parents were both really avid. And he has a shell shirt? That's actually really cool. Those look like diatoms or... Yeah, they look like diatoms. That's pretty neat. Natural historians. They love nature. They described everything that I couldn't touch. And they let me touch just about anything. And so this enabled me to get to know the world, of course. And it's also satisfied my curiosity. Mm. 
beginning at about age 10, I started seriously collecting shells. Yeah. Um, and uh, loving their scientific names and all the weird places they came from. And I was just enthralled. They were so elegant, so beautiful. Uh, such wonderful contrast between the outsides and the insides and so on. The shapes were out of this world and uh, just a whole dimension of beauty I was unfamiliar with. So, it was a, a wonderful Gary Vermeer is today... ...into the, the real biology of, of living things and ultimately the history of living things. Uh, he is today one of the foremost theoreticians of evolutionary biology. It's really kind of extraordinary. Um, remarkable scientist. He sees the big picture in ways that other people can't. And I was lucky enough to uh, to see a talk of his. Here, let me find that picture. Um, last week. Uh, at Berkeley. There we go. Here he is before the talk started. A colleague is introducing him here. And there he is right there giving the talk. No slides. He has no use for slides. Wonderful talk, though. And I felt kind of goofy about it. Like, I, I felt stupid asking him afterward to... Uh, to ask him to sign a copy of his autobiography, but I asked him nonetheless, and he was kind enough to sign it for me. And, uh, I will treasure this. It's really funny, because I, I just heard his name for the first time this summer. The state paleontologist of Utah, Jim Kirkland, recommended that I seek out this book and that I look at uh, look at Gary's work. And so I had gotten this book and then I heard that he was gonna be speaking just down the road from me in Berkeley, California. And I was able to attend his talk and that was, uh, was pretty awesome. So yeah, Jim knows what's up. Yes, indeed, MLF, yes, indeed. So yeah, anyway. You know what else is cool though? Chat, you got that question correct. And good on you for that. Excellent. Now, are you ready for the next one? You've got four left until the million dollars. Let's see if you can do it. You ready for the next one? I think you are. Let's do it. for $125,000. The question is, this early Jurassic armored dinosaur is one of the most complete ever found in the United Kingdom. Is the answer A, Scalidosaurus? B, Hyliosaurus? C, Polycanthus? Or D, Canthopholis. Hmm. What do you think, chat? Those questions getting harder. Getting harder. What do you think? Hmm. Tommy Platicus says A for awesome dino. Chuckhorn says A. Iconic Song says, we're going to be rich. Well, MS Coggin says A. A for Skelidosaurus. Well, well, well. Farf says A. Noticing uh, a Matt M33 says A also. Wow. 
getting a little bit tentative about this. We're not having a deluge of answers, but they do seem pretty consistent. People seem to be gravitating toward A for Skeletosaurus. Hmm. A yeah, tricky one, right, Claire Burr? It's a tricky one to look up, too, if people are doing that. Paleo Lord says A for Living Tank. I mean, I think all four of these could be called Living Tanks. But, um, but Paleo Lord says A? Do we want to say A here? Ice Clop says Polycanthus was found in UK. Maybe some of these other dinosaurs were also found in the UK. Clipper says, hmm, they are all UK. Iconic Song says, C wasn't Jurassic, though. Polycanthus not Jurassic. Oh, interesting. Interesting. Hmm. Some are Jurassic and some are Cretaceous, says Clipper. Well, it seems like chat is mostly gravitating toward A. Should we select A here? What do you think, chat? What do you think? Mm, we should, says Claire. Well, if Claire says it. A. Skeletosaurus. Early Jurassic armored dinosaur, one of the most complete ever found in the UK. Is that right? But Medler's not so sure. $125,000, that's a lot of money. Well, shoot. Hold on to your butts. Let's say yes. And of course you're correct. <laughs> Nicely done, chat. Nicely done. Skeletosaurus. Truckhorn wasn't even worried about it. Yeah. Let's see. Can I find that clip here? Uh, I reckon I can. Here we go. Hmm. Yeah. Look how complete this is. Yep. I mean, it's one of the earliest ones we have so far. Isn't Skutelosaurus slightly earlier, though? It's articulated. Yep. Yeah. Good stuff. Yep. Oh, maybe it is older than Scutellosaurus. Yeah. Anyway, Scutellosaurus, you get the idea there. I think you get it. We even have... A 3D printed Skeletosaurus skull, which is why this came up in the first place. I was printing this last week. It is now complete life size Skeletosaurus skull. Very nice. Yeah. Anyway, hopefully I can print that. Or print that. Paint it sometime soon. But Skeletosaurus, cool critter. Very 
cool critter, I would say. You know what else is cool? You, chat. $125,000 in your pocket. That's an eighth of a million. Let's see if you can bring that up to a quarter of a million with the next question. You ready for it? Of course you are. Let's do it. Ooh. A simple question for the quarter million. Who first discovered the coelacanth for science? Coelacanth, this most important of fishes. Is the answer A, J.L.B. Smith? B, Jacques Cousteau. Ignore that that's spelled wrong. Pretend it's spelled correctly. There should be an S at the end of Jacques. I don't know what happened there. Is it C, Marjorie Courtney Latimer? Or is it D, Harry Govier Seeley? What do you think, chat? What do you think? Golgan X says C, 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 Lecanth. I'm seeing a bunch of other C's here. Claire Burr says, oh, this is too easy. Why, what's what's the answer, Claire? What is it? <laughs> Who first discovered the coelacanth for science? It's, it's not a trick question. Coelacanth, says HD. Hmm. Not a man, says Claire Burr. Maybe Jacqueline Cousteau found the coelacanth. It's spelled wrong. Might as well be Jacqueline, Jacqueline Cousteau. <laughs> uh, oh, chat, you already know. It's Marjorie Courtney Latimer, isn't it? Let's see here. Yep. You got it. Very nice. Marjorie Courtney Latimer. Can we find a clip with her? With the woman herself? See if I can find this. Here we go. Fossils that displayed these curious limb like fins. But one fateful day in 1938, everything changed. Yeah, there she is. Welcome to Six Lakes Street. Marjorie Courtney Latimer was then the 31-year-old curator of a small natural history museum in East London, South Africa. Yep. Come, welcome it's in. her legacy. There you go, Pat Medler. She remembers yeah. well how her life was turned upside down by the mysterious coelacanth. Now Look at all these. It's beautiful. Knew the difficulties and the talk. I love that her home is to the, was then. She's since passed away. She was getting up there in age. Just filled with all this memorabilia celebrating her discovery. Was turned upside down by the mysterious Yeah. Uh, and the Smithsonian has a seal can't they do, Pimpcat? Very now cool. You got to see that. Knew the difficulties and the trauma that I went through. I went through absolute trauma saving that fish. Hmm. Because nobody wanted to know. As I say, even my family in the end began to think I was cuckoo. <laughs> <laughs> I suppose I was very cuckoo. Huh. Yeah. On December 22nd, 1938, a fishing trawl... We'll be having a very special stream on December 22nd. Or 23rd. London Harbor. Reports vary of what day it was, but... Whichever one it is, on we'll figure that out. was a pile of sea life dredged up after a... Yeah. But these fish were not all meant for market. It was a pile of sponges and, and starfish and rat-tailed fish. And you name it, they were there. When putting together new exhibits at the museum, Marjorie often obtained samples from local fishermen. Yep. 
and from underneath this cloud, there was this one fin sticking out, this Ooh. blue fin. And I thought, what on earth could this be? <laughs> and I moved all the fish. There was this beautiful, beautiful fish. Iridescent colors all over the, the fish. It was solid, it was just on five foot long, rough scales, and very big eyes. Very the coelacanth. The, these peculiar limb-like fins, something I'd never seen in a fish in my life. Marjorie Courtney Latimer as the answer to the question. And chat, you got it right. Very nice. $250,000. Just two questions left. Until the full million. Well, let's see if you can get there. There are fewer than 40 full-time dinosaur paleontologists. And holy cow, Sculpin, thank you for the five gifts. Three of them are leading this expedition. I appreciate that, Sculpin. Speaking of wonderful fishes, appreciate you, Sculpin. One just gifted five subs. Thank you, thank you. I'm sure there are five very, very happy viewers right now who won't have to watch any ads for the next 30 days. Thanks to you, Sculpin. So thank you for that. Holy cow. They are lucky winners. Let's see if you will too be lucky winners, chat. You ready for the penultimate question here? The second to last? Let's go ahead and do it. 200, oh, 500,000. Let's do it. For half a million dollars here, the second to last question, it is as follows. Which feature makes the newly named dinosaur Fujia Venator so special? This is a tricky one. We talked about this last week, I believe, or was it the week before? What makes it so special, this new dinosaur? Is the answer A, it's long legs. B, it's needle-like teeth. C, it's wishbone. Or D, it's small size. Ooh. What do you think, chat? They go all the way up. It's needle-like teeth go all the way up, Tommy Platicus? They go all the way to the ground. It's needle-like teeth go all the way to the ground. Is that right, Murph? Hmm. Uh. Well, I'm seeing some A's here. Chat seems to be focusing on A. It's long legs go all the way to the ground. But maybe it's small size goes all the way to the ground. Maybe it's wishbone goes all the way to the ground. Teeth that go all the way to the ground would be terrifying, though. Agreed, green herring. Well, various species of elephant have that. They're tusks. Um, yeah. They really like those legs, says Clarper. I guess so. Shoot, it's long legs? It's got A, and it knows how to use them, says HD. It's got its long legs, and it knows how to use them. Well, if that's the case, its long legs, Fuji Aventador special for its long legs, is that your final answer, chat? Shoot. It'd be a shame to get all this way $500,000 and lose it right here on the second to last question, but... Hold on to your butts. Let's go ahead and click yes for final answer. And of course you're correct. Very nice. Yeah. 
Fuji of Editor. You might remember this from some of the headlines that we looked at. Long-legged dinosaurs may be key to understanding how these animals became birds. Fuji of Editor, it's got long legs. It's got legs, it's got legs in all the right places. Fuji of Editor. Those legs go all the way to the ground. Look at how long those legs are. Yeah, or all the way to this dead lizard or crocodilian or whoever this is right here. Poor critter. Anyway, it's funny how they gave it a red mohawk or orangey mohawk, kind of like Anchiornis. It's a member of the same group, the Deinonychosauria. So it's a relative of Anchiornis with the red mohawk from earlier. So yeah, it's got long leggy legs. There you go. Yeah. Fuji of Venator. Yeah. Um, anyway, good stuff. And you know who's got legs long enough to reach a million dollars? Maybe you, chat. Let's see if you can do it. You ready for the next question? The final question? I think you are. Let's do it. For one million dollars. Your final question. It is as follows. What do we call the recreation of an animal's brain derived from the interior shape of its brain case. Is the answer A, cranial estimate? B, brain pan mold? C, cerebromorph? Or D, endocast? What do you think, chat? What do you think? Mm. Seeing some D's? Jack's Fax is too easy. D, baby. All right. Golgan X is D for Endiocast. Mm. Recovering Chemist was going to say B, but everyone else says D. Well, shoot, you can't use any lifelines on the last one. This is, this is tricky, chat. This is tricky. Hmm. And Ocas says Alexander Morrison. HD says D. Endo means inside or inner, no? Asked Kennedy. Does it? Mm, that might be a clue. Like endoscopy? Hmm. Well, chat, if you're so certain. Indocost. Indocaste. Indocost in French. Ice clop. I don't know how to say that in French. I'm just going to say en ando gaiest. Like an American. Man, we can't use lifelines, Claire. It's the last question. You can't do that. But it seems like chat is pretty well set on D here. For endo cast. Let's go ahead and do it. Shall we? D for endocast? Is this your final answer? What do you think, chat? A million dollars on the line. You feel that tension build? It's palpable in the air. 
You could cut it with an oyster knife, or at least pry it with an oyster knife, like you're digging dinosaurs. Do it, says Alexander Morrison. Final answer, says HD. Well, hold on to your butts. Let's say yes. And of course, you got it, chat. Very nice. You won the million dollars, chat. I'm proud of you. Thanks for paying attention. Thanks for being so clever. Thanks for being so enthusiastic. That's excellent. It really is. Thank you, thank you. Holy cow. Uh, don't spend it all in one place. Million dollars. I can buy you, uh... Quite a bit. Holy cow. Murph. Could buy you a new soccer ball. Or football. Murph. Thank you for those 20 gift subs. Holy cow. Murph. Extraordinary. I appreciate that very, very much. 20 gift subs from Murph. Thank you, Mark. We've exceeded our weekly sub goal by 28 subs. Thanks to you and everyone else who contributed, including Tommy Platicus, who just gave out a gift sub right there, too. I guess you can afford it now, chat, huh? Thank you. Murph. Thank you very, very much. Thank you for being such a stalwart supporter of this community. I appreciate that more than you know. Thank you very, very much. Holy cow. Hey, wait, it's not real money? Darn. <laughs> yeah, I know, right? <laughs> well, it's money in here. Which, actually, you probably don't want money in there. Money's dirty. You don't want that inside your cardiac tissue. Get infected. Anyway. But Mirth, thank you for your support. I appreciate it more than you know. And with that being said, I guess we'll do some ukulele next week. Maybe I'll have time to learn a new song in the time between then and now. No promises. But I really have to wrap this up and get my weekend started. I am leaving on a trip in just a little bit along the Pacific coast of these United States. So I need to wrap this up. So without further ado, let's get ready to do a raid. Don't go away just yet, chat. We're gonna go raid into somebody. Maybe somebody doing some science right here on twitch.tv. Let's see here. Mahoodles is on. Well, well, well. Let's go ahead and raid Mahoodles. She's doing some astrobiology and space news. Let's go right into her. Thank you, everybody, whose names are appearing here in the credits. Followers, gifters, subscribers, cheerers, moderators, raiders, lurkers. You might not appear in there, but I appreciate you, too. Regular viewers, thank you, everyone. Question askers and... And you, Golganak. Thank you very much for your support, Golganak. I appreciate you more than you know. We'll be talking about Edmontosaurus and doing some ukulele on Monday. And maybe I'll be showing off some photos from my trip. We'll see. Tuesday is my birthday. I'll be having a special birthday stream then. But, uh... Till then, everybody, you have a wonderful weekend. Thank you again. 
and I'll see you around. Take care of yourselves and each other. Stay curious. Till next time, everybody. Bye-bye. <laughs>